And the results will start coming in at any minute now. Will we have four more years of President Donald Trump or four years of Democratic candidates and former Vice President Joe Biden? We're live across the D.C. metro area and the country, bringing you all the information as we get it. The big races here at home and the battle for the White House. No matter how things turn out, this night will go down in history. And we've got you covered on everything you need to know. You're watching a special edition of WUSA 9. Well, the day we've been talking about, the day we've been waiting for, it's here. Election night, 2020. America will decide the future of our country. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bruce Johnson. Great to see you. I'm Lorenzo Hall. And, and Bruce, this is probably a good time to just brace ourselves. Take a deep breath. You know, we are in for a long night, but we're going to be here with you, bringing you results as we get them. In our region, we've been deciding for weeks. Polls just closed in Virginia. They closed at 730 in West Virginia, 8 o'clock in Maryland and D.C. And tonight we're just focused on numbers. It's about what your vote meant and what happens next. Yeah, that's why we're bringing you team coverage throughout the night. We're spread out across the D.C. metro area, covering races no matter where you live. We're also speaking with experts to provide context throughout the evening as the results start coming in. So sit back, relax, we've got you covered. Let's start with Adam Longo. He's tracking the races from the big board. Adam. So uh, Bruce Lorenzo, good evening. I want to take you through this uh, exciting technology that we'll be able to showcase for you throughout the evening. One thing that it's going to do is it's going to break out the electoral map right now. You can see his votes are already starting to come in from here in the state of Indiana, which is already lit up in a, a shade of red. That's not to mean that that state has been called. That's just the way it's leaning right now. I know that you've been watching CBS Evening News, so you've already got an hour of that national coverage under your belt. So I want to focus specifically right now on some of the local coverage and how our local counties are breaking out and what we expect to see from them tonight and be able to compare that to what happened in 2016. So to do that, I'm going to take you first to one of the closest counties in our area in the presidential race in 2016. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to take us to Maryland and I'm going to focus in on Anne Arundel County. The key in Anne Arundel County in 2016, this was again the closest just by two points spread. The Democrat Hillary Clinton won Anne Arundel County with 47.5% of the vote. The President Trump's 45.3. So the big question for tonight, will that flip? Will Joe Biden's lead perhaps increase, the Democratic lead in Anne Arundel uh, increase? Could that actually flip? Similarly, we'll be watching another county in Maryland that also had uh, very close tendencies, and that's in Frederick County. So in Frederick County in 2016, we saw the Democratic candidate, uh, Hillary Clinton, get 47.5 percent, and President Trump actually won uh, Frederick County. I actually did that backwards, so let me do this. <laughs> President Trump with 47.5% and Hillary Clinton had 45. So this is a very purple county, right? A county that could potentially flip. So if Joe Biden's numbers go up and President Trump's go down, that could mean Frederick County flips and goes blue. Also one county that we're going to be keeping an eye on down in Virginia. And that is the county that was the closest in 2016. And when I say closest, it really wasn't close. It was by nine points. But the one county in our the one county in our area is Stafford County that I'm going to focus in on. So in Stafford County, Virginia, uh, President Trump actually won with 51.4% uh, of the vote. So the question is, this is the big divide right through Stafford County. Up here, these are the urban voters, suburban voters, and down here are the rural voters. So will we see that gulf widen between President Trump and Joe Biden? Will he get more votes uh, or will this actually close the gap and move to being more of a, a purple county? I want to take you also through some of the Senate races that we'll be following uh, through the night because these are key. And as we look, of course, locally, we want to talk about Virginia and Senator Mark Warner uh, up against uh, Army veteran uh, uh, Mr. Gade. And so that's going to be one that we're keeping a close eye on to see if that has been called. All right, so the, uh, just getting some news right now. The Associated Press is actually calling the state of Kentucky for President Trump. So if we were to refresh this, perhaps that would turn this state red in just a second. I'm able to actually do that with our board right here. So that's going to give President Trump a lead, the first state to be called eight electoral votes. One thing I want to tell you before we send it back to you, Lorenzo, and that is in the state of Maryland, okay? Maryland was one of the earliest states in the country to begin counting those mail-in ballots with what we expect from the numbers that we get when Maryland polls close at 8 o'clock plus the mail-in ballots that have already been counted. It wouldn't surprise me if Maryland is one of the very early states that's called this evening. So.
minutes after the polls have closed and we already got one call. All right, Adam, thank you. Hopefully we can start filling in more of that map soon. And you know, aside from Adam, Adam's fancy touch screen there, what else separates our news team from everyone else in town? The Verify team. Yeah, they do more than separate fact from fiction. They show you how they get the answers to your questions. Evan Kozlov is part of that team and he joins us live right now. Hey, Evan. Hey there, guys. Yeah, the Verify team is going to be working all night to clear up confusion and help fight misinformation about both the election and the election process. And look, we've got a team of researchers across the country who are working to cut through the political spin, separate fact from fiction. Now, we're going to need your help tonight. If you see something suspicious online, just send it our way before you share it. Our inbox is verify at WUSA9.com. <laughs> all right, Evan, thank you. As predicted, people are gathering to react to the night's election results. You're looking live from uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, which is right near the White House on the other side of Lafayette Park. Our Eric Flack has been out there for several hours now. Eric, what are you seeing and what are people saying to you? Hey, Bruce, good evening. You know, it is, as you might imagine, a very pro uh, Vice President Biden uh, and uh, Kamala Harris crowd out here. Uh, the majority of the people out here are hoping that this will not be a victory for President Trump. Uh, they've been gathering since about four o'clock today. The crowds are small, but they're vocal. A lot of this loosely organized by a group called Shutdown DC, which at one point had a uh, big, huge truck with a go-go band on it. They actually shut down 16th and K. Blocks of 16th Street shut down right now so people can mill about. The largest crowds we're going to find are obviously right down there at Lafayette Square Park, uh, which the barricades are, of course, up as they have been uh, off and on throughout this summer uh, with the White House in the background. I did ask uh, one of the uh, women who uh, came down here uh, this afternoon uh, into the evening what she was hoping from the night, and here's what she had to say. This is historic because we are here, the people are here, so that we can celebrate all of the work that we've been doing for the last months and make sure that we celebrate the work that we're doing and also get us ready for what comes next. Because voting is one part of the process. We also have to do accountability. And they are hope account hoping accountability uh, translates into an election night victory uh, for Vice President Biden. Now, uh, sh uh, Shutdown DC was hoping to have a, a jumbotron down here to let people watch election results. That did not happen. That did not pan out. But this, uh, we uh, people are starting to gather around this building right here that does have some election results coming in. Uh, there is no sound, but obviously that's going to be a focal point. Really, one of the only people places people can get the results in live time, uh, other than their phones, which obviously will be happening as well. We're going to be here all night monitoring these crowds and the reaction as the results come in. Reporting live from Black Lives Matter Plaza, Eric Flack, WUSA 9. Eric, as we said earlier, it's either going to be a party or a protest right down there. Lorenzo. All right, yeah, Bruce, you know, D.C. Police Chief Peter Newsom, he anticipates that crowds will get even bigger downtown during the course of the evening, and he has this simple message. Uh, if you're coming down here to exercise your First Amendment right, uh, we welcome you. Uh, we're going to assist you in any way that we can. Uh, if you come down here with the intention of committing violence or hurting somebody, uh, we have a responsibility, and we're going to have to take you into custody to make sure that you're held accountable. Now, the police chief goes on to say his staff is at full capacity tonight, planning for the worst, but hoping for the best. So are we. Now, we want to bring in Dr. David Carroll into this conversation. He's an associate professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland. Dr. Carroll, thank you for being here with us. It's good to be here with you tonight. All right. So, you know, we have all these scenarios. We're talking about how this night can play out in terms of the electoral map. Um, what are you zeroing in on specifically, if you could narrow this down for our viewers watching right now? Well, uh, some states are going to report their uh, vote much more thoroughly than others. So we can learn a lot, for example, from Florida, which could be a decisive state. Later in the evening, Arizona could be another decisive state. That's a battleground state where they've been counting votes for days and days, so we should hear from them this evening. But even states that are not battleground states, like uh, Kentucky returns are being reported, it's good to look at the margin. 
Uh, once we know that it's a complete result for a state or a county, we can compare it to 2016. And it's no surprise that President Trump is winning Kentucky, but if he ends up winning it by several points less than he did last time, that's still information as to how the race is going across the country. Yeah, you know, we've been talking about the presidential race here, but the Senate races are also very critical. We know the Democrats are trying to take back the Senate in this case right now. The GOP has about 53 seats, uh, the Democrats 47s, and the Democrats need roughly three or four seats to make that happen. But uh, it's not that simple, right, because a lot of these races or seats that are up for grabs right now are in uh, typically Republican districts. Well, it's definitely a very competitive contest. Uh, there are several important races on the East Coast, actually. Uh, in Maine, uh, Susan Collins, a longtime Republican senator, is in a tight race. Um, as we go down the eastern seaboard, uh, Senator Tillis in North Carolina is being challenged by the Democrat Cal uh, Cunningham. And there are actually two Senate seats up in Georgia, a regular election and a special election. Um, so, uh, And then further west, um, the competitive races in uh, Iowa, in Montana, in Colorado, and in uh, Arizona. Uh, and then there's some that are kind of more uh, reaches, I would say, for the Democrats. But th several, several of those states, and again, a lot of them on the East Coast as it happens. All right, so I know a lot of people watching want to know They're, the counts are being or the county is underway right now for those uh, mail in ballots, the ballots that have been put in those uh, ballot boxes. We've heard that it's going to take a while for these states to, to know the true numbers and the true results. But is it at all possible that we could know who won the presidential race tonight? Do you think it's possible? I do think it is possible that we would have a very good sense of it. It would not be formally, legally the case. You know, states take days to certify their results. But yes, you know, because I mentioned these states that are going to count pretty quickly. Uh, if Vice President Biden wins Florida, uh, and or it's, or it's very clear that he's winning Florida late tonight and Arizona, he's in an excellent position. Uh, and so... I, I think we, you know, we're not going to get the official results for a number of days. The popular vote, we won't know for days and days, the final number. But we actually, uh, if, the, if the polls in the, that we've seen the last few days hold up and, and it turns out they were accurate, we will actually by late this evening have a pretty good sense of where we are. All right. It's still early. Dr. Carroll will be checking with you throughout the evening as well. And we do have another alert right now. The AP is calling the Virginia Senate race for Mark Warner, the Democrat there in Virginia. He's been in that seat since 2008, so he will get another term there. Again, the AP calling that Virginia Senate race for Mark Warner. Bruce? Lorenzo, thanks a lot. AP has also uh, given Vermont to Joe Biden. No surprise there. If you're in line in Virginia right now, I should say if you know somebody who's lined, even though the polls close at 7 o'clock, election officials are telling us you can still vote if you're in line. But Bruce LeShan is live at the Fairfax Government Center and says there haven't been many lines in the Commonwealth. Well, well that, that's absolutely right, Bruce, but look at this. That's a wrap. Right at 7 o'clock, election workers came out here, taped up this ballot drop box, got the couple of hundred ballots that people had dropped off today and took them inside. And look at this, all the political signs that used to be lined up right here. Well, those have all been taken away as well by the volunteers, by the partisans. Now, Virginia elections officials say that some 2.54 million Virginians voted early. That is half, almost half of all the registered voters in Virginia and about two thirds of all the people who voted in 2016. Now, all that early voting has really meant that Election Day has run very, very smoothly. What a difference 45 days of early voting has made. Remember those long lines and up to seven hour waits before Election Day? Virginia elections officials say nearly half of all the registered voters in the state voted early. That's made Election Day a quick in and out for many voters. We should all move 45 day early. All we're, and I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, Independent. The goal is to get everybody to vote. In Prince William County, they did run into some ballot scanning issues at two polling places. They rushed in new gear, tallied some ballots by hand, and assured everyone affected that their votes would be counted. While there have been minor issues, nothing that we didn't anticipate necessarily. 
and at no point was voting interrupted. Virginia was once a battleground, but the national focus has now shifted elsewhere. A lot of voters here say they are nervously awaiting the count in the most heavily contested states. A little worried, but I'm glad it's almost over. I can't wait to see the results tonight. Well, it's my first presidential um, vote today, so I feel really um, exciting. Now, Fairfax County elections officials say that they should start sending in numbers in the next hour or so. They say the first results will be people who voted in person today on election day. And polls have suggested that many of the people who waited until today uh, tended to skew towards the Republicans. More Republicans uh, intended to vote on election day. The early voting numbers, the folks that voted early, those results could come in, could start getting posted about 11 p.m. or later. And again, the folks, many of them, the polls have suggested that many of the folks that uh, came out and voted in person early, mailed in, tended to skew towards the Democrats. Live in Fairfax County, Bruce Lashan, WUSA 9. Yeah, Bruce, thanks a lot. And for people who have watched Virginia over the recent years, uh, this means translation that if Trump jumps out in front, don't be surprised if Biden overtakes him as we go on through the evening. Lorenzo? Hi, yeah, Bruce, you know, we're keeping a close that eye on several swing states across the country right now, and that includes Ohio. Polls there close at 7.30 tonight, so in about 14 minutes. But right now, and joining us to talk more is Mark Namick with our sister station in Cleveland. And Mark, how are things looking there right now? Well, it's, it's exciting for this reason. We have faded as a battleground state in recent years. President Trump carried this state four years ago by eight percentage points over Hillary Clinton. But polls in the last few months have shown it really a dead heat. And the evidence that the candidates believe that is they've spent a lot of time here. President Trump making six visits since uh, the beginning of this year. And Joe Biden and his ticket coming here since the first presidential debate six times at the end of, uh, since the end of uh, September. Now, traditionally, Cuyahoga County is a very heavily Democratic. It's still going to go that way. But it's considered a firewall in this state, along with the Columbus area, Franklin County, and Cincinnati. Uh, candidates who win the White House have to rack up high numbers. This is where they got to get it. And if they don't, they lose. And right now, turnout in Cuyahoga County is running a little bit behind what the state is anticipating. And in Cleveland, which they rely on a lot, is uh, trailing just a bit. Now, turnout uh, numbers uh, thus far uh, relative to the idea of early voting, we track with the national, national trends. Uh, we had huge turnouts here. Uh, five and a half million uh, votes cast early. Uh, that's well over 70 percent of the votes. So they will be, uh, you know, looking at this final co count, and we will be uh, getting results here around 2 a.m. in Cuyahoga County. Uh, reporting from Cuyahoga County and Cleveland, Mark Namick. Wow, five and a half million early votes. Mark, thank you so much. Bruce. Okay, right now, let's continue our coverage with Stephen Shepard. He's with Politico. He's been covering the races and watching the polls closely. Steve, thanks for joining us. I heard Joe Biden say earlier this evening that if he wins Florida, if he comes out in front in Florida, it's all over. You agree with that? Hello, Steve. Can you hear me? Having problems with Steve. Okay. Okay, uh, do we wrap now? Adam. All right, I want to take you through. We're finally starting to get some numbers come in from Virginia. Here's a look at the board so far. So Kentucky has been called for President Trump. Vermont has been called for uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. Let's zoom in on Virginia here where we're starting to get uh, some results. Let me turn this off so I can zoom in on here to show you a little bit more. We're going to be able to go county by county. Virginia, 1% of the vote reporting. You can see where those votes are coming in from. The deep reds are the ones that President Trump is winning far and away from. And then the lighter color, it's a more close race. You can see that these are some of the rural counties, except for here. Uh, this is uh, Richmond, where right now, with just 17% reporting, uh, President Trump coming in at 53% uh, percent of the vote. But obviously, we want to be looking at things on total, because this is just one percentage point of Virginia coming in so far. 
despite that, we do know that the Associated Press has right now called the Virginia Senate race uh, for uh, incumbent Democratic Senator Mark Warner over Army veteran Daniel Gade. Another map that we'll be keeping a close eye on tonight is this balance of power in the Senate. We fully do not expect for the Senate to be decided by the end of this night. It was not in 2018, if you'll recall. Some of those Senate races took a few weeks. Some key races will be watching. The two Senate races in Georgia, one of them is a special election seat and the other uh, is uh, John Ossoff against David uh, Perdue, who is the incumbent senator. Also Arizona, a state that could very well flip uh, astronaut Mark Kelly against uh, Martha McSally, who was the incumbent appointed by Governor Doug Ducey uh, just two years ago after she lost in her race to Kirsten Cinema. So as we look at these numbers, Come in. You can see right now Joe Biden with 50% of the vote across the country, but this is only a total of about 6 million votes that have come in, so not a clear snapshot. As we start to get results th throughout the night, this map will color in. So, for instance, uh, and I don't think this is a stretch here, we can suspect that by the end of the night, the West Coast states will go uh, to Joe Biden, and New York and Illinois would go to uh, uh, Joe Biden as well. So, we'll be keeping a close eye on this. Uh, Zoe, let's bring it back to you. All right. Thank you, Adam. And we're glad you're with us for this expanded digital coverage of election night. Here's what's about to happen. We're going to pause this digital show very briefly as we get set up for a local race update on TV. So stay right there where you are. We'll continue in just a moment.
This is a WUSA 9 update on election night here in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bruce Johnson. Polls are now closed in Virginia, but in Maryland and D.C., you still have a little more time, a little more than a half hour to cast your ballots. Polls there close at 8 o'clock. As long as you're in line by that time, you will be allowed to vote. Our Jess Arnold joins us now. She's live in Frederick, Maryland, uh, where there's still lines there at this hour, right, Jess? Yeah, pretty long lines, Bruce. I'm here at the front of the line at Tuscarora High School. Now, this is one of 18 voting centers in Frederick County, Maryland. I'm going to step out of the way to give you a look at that line. As you can see, that wraps all the way around the building. Now, a poll worker I talked to within the last hour told me that the last person in line will probably be waiting about 75 minutes until they can get inside and vote. And there's also a line inside of there. I was in the voting center earlier. Some people have told me, though, it's moving pretty quickly. Now, according to Maryland State Department of Election data that was released today, 28% of eligible active voters in Frederick County voted early. Now, that's not including mail-in or provisional ballots. So I asked a bunch of voters here why they didn't take advantage of early voting options, and I got a variety of answers. Some told me they went to a polling place yesterday and the lines were even longer, so they thought they might have a better shot coming out today which I also heard over at Urbana Library about six miles away. But here's why another voter waited until Election Day. I hadn't decided who I wanted to vote for, so we waited until last minute. Now, as you mentioned, Bruce, voters have until 8 o'clock to get in line here and vote, so we'll keep an eye on how long the polls stay open. Bruce. Jess Arnold. Jess, thanks a lot for that. Crowds continue to gather at Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House in anticipation of tonight's election results. Several groups of people are down there. Among them, shut down D.C., which is anti-Trump. Black Lives Matter Plaza has become a gathering point, as you know, for protesters who support a change in administration. And this election night is no different. Eric Flack is down there right now. He joins us. Eric. Hey, Bruce, uh, as you've mentioned, the crowds have been gathering uh, organized loosely by shutdown DC since about four o'clock today. It is, as you might imagine, a decidedly pro Vice President Biden crowd. Uh, many people here telling me they believe and hope that this will signal the end of the Donald Trump era in the White House. As for the White House, it is behind me over my shoulder. Those are the very uh, decently uh, small uh, but mighty crowd that is gathered down here on the on this on the border of Lafayette Square Park, which is of course protected by that barricade and serves as the dividing line between those calling for an end to President Trump's uh, era here in the White House and the White House itself. There's about four blocks of 16th Street that is blocked off right now, blocked off by D.C. police. There is a throng of media here. It goes a number of blocks that way. The majority of the crowd is over my shoulder. Everything is fairly sparse. It's been very calm. No confrontations that I've seen. Only limited interactions between DC police and the people, protesters, and advocates that are down here tonight. We'll keep an eye on it for the rest of the night. Thanks Bruce? a lot, and we'll be back with another local update for you in a half hour. We're gonna send it back to CBS News coverage right now. Our local coverage continues online at WUSA9.com and the WUSA9.
are back now with live coverage of the 2020 election. You voted and now we got to wait for those results to come in. Good evening and thank you for watching our live coverage this election night. I'm Lorenzo Hall. And good to be with you, Lizzo. I'm Leslie Foster and we'll be with you all night long. So stay with us. We're covering everything you need to know from the big presidential race to the local races here at home. The polls are closed in Virginia. Uh, they are closing now in West Virginia. Polls close at 8 o'clock for both Maryland and D.C. But one thing is for sure, voters came out in big numbers this election yeah, day. Look at those long lines mm -hmm. there, Les. And you know, your vote matters, and our team is watching the numbers as they come in. We know that Kentucky was called by the AP for President Trump, and Vermont goes to former VP Joe Biden. Our Adam Long goes at the big board tonight, breaking it all down for us. Hey, Adam. Hi, Joe. Hi, Leslie. One other thing that the AP has called this night so far is the Senate race involving incumbent Democratic Senator from Virginia, Mark Warner. You can see him uh, speaking there live now, addressing uh, his, his supporters, uh, whether there's actually anyone there in person or whether he's doing this virtually. It's not uh, clear. Uh, he is triumphant over his challenger, Republican uh, Daniel Gade, who was a uh, Army veteran. So uh, as uh, Senator Warner is speaking there, he is just one of a handful of senators across the country up for re-election tonight. Uh, many other races much tighter than the one uh, facing Senator Warner. We are starting to get some results back now, and I want to take you through these real quick. Basically, this is the electoral map as it shakes out right now. You see the deep red there. That's Kentucky. That has been called for President Trump. And the deep blue up here, you probably can't see that because it's so small, but that is the state of Vermont. Those are the two states that have been called so far. But what I want to take you into is uh, some of the uh, more local numbers that we're getting. And we're actually starting to get some numbers from Virginia. So statewide right now with about 1% of the precinct and mail-in reporting. Again, remember Virginia cannot count its uh, absentee mail-in ballots until today. They couldn't start until today. So we're not going to see this massive number of ballots come in all at once in Virginia. But as you can see right now, from these very, very early returns, President Trump leading with about 66% uh, percent of the vote. We're going to come in here and take a closer look at uh, some of the county-by-county county setups in Virginia. And one uh, county that we'll be keeping our close eye on uh, throughout the night is uh, Loudoun County. So our friends there uh, in Northern Virginia. So President Trump right now with 1% uh, of the precincts reporting coming in at 50 53%, but I want to contrast that with what we saw in 2016. So 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton won Loudoun County with 55.1% of the vote, uh, President Trump getting 38%. So these numbers obviously very early. We're not sure what precincts those are coming from, but those numbers likely to change as we go through the evening. Loudoun County has been a purple county that has trended, started trending in the direction of deep blue. Will that continue tonight? Will we see uh, Joe Biden increase the Democratic majority in Loudoun County, or perhaps will President Trump make up some additional ground there? Another county that I'm going to want to watch uh, as we move through the evening uh, in Northern Virginia, uh, Spotsylvania County. Spotsylvania County, just south of Stafford and Fredericksburg, a county that's uh, deep red, 55.6% uh, going to President Trump. So we'll be keeping a close eye there. Also in Maryland, uh, one more thing before I let you go. No results coming back yet because the polls don't close till 8 o'clock. But I suspect that once the polls close, Maryland was one of the first states in the country to be able to start counting uh, absentee ballots. 89% of those absentee ballots have been received and counted, tallied by the state of Maryland. So we're going to get that plus the early voting. 25% of Maryland participated in early voting. We are going to get a cascade of numbers from Maryland. Once polls close there, I suspect that Maryland will be one of those states that we call very early on tonight. Leslie? We will see. And of course, when there's a presidential election, all eyes are on several key states, which includes Pennsylvania. Both President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden spent a lot of time there. Stacey Lang is in Scranton, Joe Biden's hometown, and he made a stop there this morning, too. Yes, he did, Leslie. Good evening. We're here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is the county seat for Lackawanna County. There are 67 total counties in Pennsylvania, and each one of those counties tonight, you're going to see scenes like behind me, folks counting ballots, canvassing in them, and, the, and then scanning them in. Um, this machine, like Glenn is here behind me, they started this process at 7 a.m. this morning. They have a total of 40,000 ballots that they have to go through. They're just about at the 30,000 mark, and they expect to be done around 11 o'clock tonight. They're making quick work of it. But the entire nation is watching this process in each of these counties in Pennsylvania since, as you said, it's going to play such a pivotal role in this election. Scranton has also been a big talking point in this election, as it is Joe Biden's hometown. He stopped by early this morning, just after the polls opened, and we had an opportunity to speak with him one-on-one. -on -one. 
Former Vice President Joe Biden and his motorcade pulled up to the Carpenters Union building in South Scranton for a last minute campaign stop only hours after the polls opened. It was overwhelming. We, we weren't expecting it and uh, we got word this morning and it's very exciting and we're pushing for him. We phone bank for him and uh, with the with the help of everyone, he'll be president. Biden introduced the crowd to two of his granddaughters who wanted to tag along to see their grandfather's hometown. Inside the union building, we had a few minutes to talk to Biden one on one. He said he wanted to visit Scranton for good luck. He said he's feeling good about his chances in battleground Pennsylvania. I am so optimistic about I really mean this about America's chances. We're so much better positioned than any nation in the world to own the 21st century. And we just got to step up. Biden addressed the divisiveness of this presidential campaign and fears that the results may lead to violence in some parts of the country. Can you ever think of an election in your lifetime where people are worried about an arrest in an election? Look, it's not going to happen because the American people, their voices are going to be heard. Over 100 million people have already voted, already voted in the United States of America. They're going to determine, no matter what the president says or any, anybody outside says, they're going to have their voices heard. This is going to be a peaceful transition. It's going to move forward. Biden's campaign moved on to Philadelphia after the stop in Scranton. It was brief, but meant a lot to the former vice president's supporters. It was really emotional. Like today is a really um, nerve wracking day. Like I want to be optimistic and hopeful, but I also want to kind of go in with no expectations in case like things don't go exactly how we want. So it was really emotional, like seeing him actually in person and like being able to look at him and not just through like a TV screen or like through my phone screen. All right, that was Stacey Lang reporting. Thank you so much. And by the way, we just learned that AP has called West Virginia for President Trump. We want to bring Dr. David Carroll into this conversation right now. He's an associate professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland. Dr. Carroll, good to see you again. First up, let's talk about Pennsylvania a bit more here. Why is this generally considered a battleground state? Talk to me about the makeup there, the, the electorate. Well, it's a very diverse state, Lorenzo. You have two major cities in Philadelphia and uh, Pittsburgh and some smaller cities like Scranton. Uh, and then there are a large number of rural counties. Uh, so uh, you have affluent suburbanites. You have a lot of African-Americans in Philadelphia. You have, uh, you know, largely white populations in the middle of the state. So, um, you know, those different uh, demographics uh, lean strongly towards the Democrats or the Republicans, depending on the group. Uh, so it's a mix. A lot of the counties or, or, or neighborhoods are very strongly in favor of one party. But when you throw it all into one big statewide mix, it's fairly balanced. Yeah, you know, we heard President Trump saying days ago that he's going to send in his lawyers into Pennsylvania if this race uh, seems unfair, because we do know that the Supreme Court is allowing uh, the Board of Elections there to continue counting some of those absentee ballots once the polls close tonight. Uh, is there anything that the president can do to challenge this race if everything does go smoothly in Pennsylvania? Well, I mean, he can uh, they they can raise the question about these ballots and then the court, uh, you know, could decide. It's not clear necessarily that the late arriving ballots will be uh, as one sided in their party uh, you know, a makeup as, for example, the early mail-in vote or the first day of early voting uh, was very democratic in many places. So uh, he can he can always try and bring a case that the states don't certify the vote uh, officially for several days after the election. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in 2000, we saw that in Florida, you know, that went all the way to the Supreme Court and that took weeks to play out. So hopefully, uh, uh, this uh, is a decisive result for the country one way or the other. But yes, there can be ch legal challenges brought to the counting process and to the certification uh, of the vote. All right, we know the polls closed in Virginia roughly 38 minutes ago, and we're learning that the AP is calling Virginia uh, for Vice President Joe Biden. Are you surprised there at all? Not at all, but, you know, uh, uh, looking at it in a kind of historical perspective in the, our region, it is a striking change. Uh, Virginia voted for George W. Bush. It was seen as a very Republican state, uh, and it was then a battleground state in the Obama years and in 2016. Uh, and now it's just off the map politically because of the growth of the Democratic vote in Northern Virginia. And it's a striking change in a relatively short period of time. But as of for tonight, no, it's what I expected. 
Yeah, I'm intrigued with what's happening in Virginia over the last couple of years. We're going to talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Dr. David Carroll, in the meantime, thank you so much. All right, let's talk about Maryland ads. Told you about the epic number of people who voted. Really record breaking. You can see some long lines. There were some today. Polls closed in less than 30 minutes. Here's what it looked like in Calvert County. Scott Broom joins us now live with how things are looking right now. Scott. Well, I'm in Prince George's County at this huge voting center they set up at FedEx Field anticipating perhaps lots and lots of voters, but so many people early voted, 60%. And this is a typical story across our region that the crowd turnout today was fairly light. There was never any really big line here at FedEx Field. But in totality, if you had in all the early votes and mail-in voting and all the rest of it, voter turnout was quite high. In fact, the county executive here said she expects it to set a record. She also said this is an indication of African-American voter enthusiasm, not only here in this county, but across the country. And of course, the vice president, Joe, uh, former vice president Joe Biden, thinks that may, that may be a factor in tipping the scale in his direction. The county executive here, Angela Also Brooks, also talked about uh, her thoughts looking forward, particularly into tonight and tomorrow and the next couple of days in downtown Washington. I'm expecting uh, that there will be a piece about what happens this evening. That is my hope, um, not only for our jurisdiction, but for our country, uh, is that people have come out. They have made their voices known at these ballot boxes. They have been undeterred. Uh, and I'm just really hopeful and prayerful that after what we have tonight, uh, that we will have uh, peace uh, and that we'll be able to come together as a country. Peace through the ballot box, Angela also Brooks said. Back here at FedEx Field, there have been no lines throughout the day. This is the county's big, biggest vote center set up to be COVID-19 compliant and to keep lots of people socially distanced. And there were 40 other voting stations in the county set up in similar fashion here today, all set up to maximize social distancing while minimizing the threat of the virus. Local authorities are declaring that part of the mission accomplished. Polls close here in just a few minutes at 8 o'clock, and there is still a drop box open for those who are late getting those in. It is obviously too late to mail them. Reporting live in Prince George's County, Scott Broom, WUSA 9. There is still time to do what you need to do. If you've got that ballot, you can put it in that drop box. All right, Scott, thank you. I'm going to send it over to Adam, who's at our, what are we calling this, our magic wall? What is this? Uh, so this is just a full picture of the electoral map. We'll have to come up with a catchy name for it, won't we? So as things stand right now with the states that have been called by the Associated Press, we heard just a moment ago that the AP has called Virginia for Joe Biden. He already has Vermont. President Trump uh, taking the victory, according to the AP, in West West Virginia and Kentucky. So this is the current electoral situation on the map. 16 electoral votes uh, for former Vice President Biden and 13 uh, for President Trump. I want to take you through the uh, United States Senate real quick, right? The balance of power here. Just in also from the Associated Press, we can take uh, the Senate seat in West Virginia and we can go ahead and call that for Senator incumbent Senator uh, Shelley Moore Capito, who wins over uh, Paula Swearinger, who is an environmental activist. Uh, that one race apparently uh, oh, here it is right here. I was going to say it was going to be uh, so uh, out there that they didn't have it on the map, but there it was. We're still waiting for the numbers to actually feed into the touchscreen board on that one so far. But uh, the incumbent senator from West Virginia is taking that. We are also getting some numbers coming in from some of these battleground Senate races that we'll be closely watching, including uh, incumbent Senator Republican Lindsey Graham uh, in South Carolina, uh, who is in a tight race with uh, with Jamie Harrison, uh, much tighter than 1% of the polls reporting would indicate right now. Uh, Lindsey Graham ahead with 71% of the vote at this point. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell in Kentucky, uh, Amy McGrath, his uh, uh, opponent. This has been a race that both parties have dumped a ton of money into uh, McConnell is expected to pull this out. If you believe the polls, this race has not been called yet. I want to take you through some of the county data now that we are seeing from Virginia. 22% of precincts reporting, despite the fact that the AC, the AP has called uh, Joe Biden the winner in Virginia. These numbers are slowly starting to trickle in, so these are a little bit behind. But you can see this color coding on Virginia here. The deeper the color, the wider the gulf between the Republican and the Democratic candidates. So you look here in the area of Southwest Virginia and you see 
how deep of a red that is down here. So these are counties that President Trump is just walking away with very handedly. So here's Buchanan County. Look, 88%, uh, right? But now let's go back up and look at some of our counties right here in Northern Virginia. So we're finally getting some results in from Fairfax. You see uh, former Vice President Biden winning with 60% uh, of the vote right now. Fairfax County in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton won with 64.4% of the vote. Something that's going to be really key to watch as we go throughout the evening and we start to get some results that more closely mirror a more accurate picture of these jurisdictions. What we're going to be looking at is comparing the vote counts right from 2016 to 2020. What's happening with those vote counts in counties like Fairfax? Are they widening or are they getting more narrow? Because what we can extrapolate from that is likely voter sentiment in other counties of similar demographic nature uh, throughout the country. So as I come back out here, we can show you over in Loudoun County, again, with just 1% reporting uh, President Trump ahead with 53% of the vote, despite the fact that Loudoun County uh, in 2016 went solidly uh, Democratic with Hillary Clinton getting 55.1% uh, of the vote. Let's take you in through just cycle you through some of our other local counties right now. So this is Arlington, 4%. You can see Joe Biden. Uh, this is quite expected uh, to be handily in the lead with 86% of the vote. Alexandria is here right next door, 71%. But then as we sneak further south, you can see the color start to change to a lighter red and then a more deeper red. So here in Prince William County, you can see, oh, look, 98% of the returns are in. This one is super close, y'all. Look at this. 49% President Trump to 48% Biden. Again, these numbers are just academic, just for curiosity's sake at this point, because we know that the AP has already called Virginia uh, for former Vice President Biden. Now look and see as we get further south into Fauquier County, for instance, how much deeper red those colors get. Again, this is just with 57% uh, of the precincts reporting. Go back out statewide and you can get a, just a better look of those that color scheme here. Again, deeper red, more solidly President Trump, deeper blue like we see here in Arlington, more solidly Joe Biden. So. All right, thank you, Adam. And you know, another key state we are watching tonight, Florida, 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 with its 29 electoral votes. We're starting to see some of those numbers come in from there right now. A lot of people watching this state very closely, including Eric Glasser from our sister station in Tampa. He joins us live with much more. Hey, Eric. Hey, Lorenzo, and thanks for checking in with us here in Florida. The reason uh, that we're in Pinellas County tonight, which is a suburb of Tampa, Florida, is because if the state of Florida is purple, then Pinellas County is the purplest of the purple counties inside of a purple state. It is almost evenly divided, about 256,000 registered Democrats, just under 4,000 fewer registered Republicans, and about 200,000 NPAs, or as we say here in Florida, no party affiliation. That means independence. And in the last 40 years, that is 10 presidential election cycles, Pinellas County has accurately predicted the outcome of the presidential election every time, with the exception of the 2000 vote. And of course, that was Bush v. Gore. We put a little asterisk next to that to go along with the hanging chads. 537 votes altogether deciding Florida in that election. But other than that, again, in the last 40 years, as Pinellas County has gone, so has the state of Florida. And more often than not, as the state of Florida goes, so does the presidential election. So you've got election watchers from all over the country watching Pinellas County to see how it's going. Again, polls closed here at 7 o'clock. We have the panhandle votes. They actually close at 8 o'clock our time because they're on central time. So we're going to hold off a little bit on that. But the early returns from Pinellas County that we could see right away, those are the mail-in ballots. Those are going to be the early voting ballots. They're already starting to come out. And as of the early count on those, Biden has about an 8% lead right now. So does that bode well for him? We'll see whether or not, once again, Pinellas County is the canary in the proverbial coal mine. As of right now, that would bode well for former Vice President Biden, but we'll just have to see how the numbers play out, Lorenzo. Oh, yeah, a lot of pressure for the voters there. And uh, Eric, what have they been telling you as we wait for those uh, final numbers to, to come in? Well, we're going to have to wait and see how it goes. Again, in Florida, it's going to come down to a question of margins. It's not just whether or not, for example, Hillsborough County, which is where Tampa is, Pinellas County, where St. Petersburg is. It's not a question of simply winning. It's the amount that you win by, because Florida is a divided state. So you've got down in South Florida, very liberal-leaning uh, counties. On the southwest portion of the state around Fort Myers, 
uh, again, very, very conservative. And of course, up in the hand, panhandle, they say the farther north you go, the farther south you go in the state of Florida. So you know how those votes are going to go. The question, again, is one of margins. Will you necessarily win all the counties in our area? Probably not. But the margin of victory is really what's going to count as those votes all add up. Again, in Florida, we have to wait a little bit while longer, only about 10 more minutes until we start to see all of those votes start to come out. We'll have a little bit better handle on it then because that's when the panhandle will close its precincts and all of those results will start to funnel out, Lorenzo. All right, 10 more minutes. I think we, we can do that one. All right, Eric Glasser there in Tampa. Thank you so much for that update, my friend. We've been saying patience, patience, and more patience. <laughs> and we're so breath. glad you're with us for this expanded digital coverage of election night. So here was, here's what's about to happen. We're going to pause this digital show briefly as we get set up for a local race update on television. Yeah, so stay right where you are. We're going to continue in just a minute.
This is a WUSA 9 update on election night here in the D.C., Maryland and Virginia area. Good evening. I'm Leslie Foster. The polls are now closed in Virginia and West Virginia, and we're starting to get in some results. We go to West Virginia, where President Trump has been declared the winner of that state. In the West Virginia Senate race, Republican Shelley Moore Capito has been declared the winner, and Republican Jim Justice has just been reelected as the West Virginia governor. In Virginia, former Vice President Joe Biden has been declared the presidential winner in that state. Also in Virginia, Democrat Mark Warner has been reelected for another six year term to the U.S. Senate. And here's what he had to say just a few minutes ago. I hope uh, this campaign has made you proud. I hope tonight will mark a turning point for both our Commonwealth and for our country. All across America, we've seen the remarkably devastating effects of the pandemic. 230,000 Americans have died. 30 million Americans have either lost their job or had their jobs reduced. Hundreds of thousands of small businesses are shuttered. And millions of Virginians and tens of millions of Americans are just hanging on, trying to make ends meet. In order to get the economy going again, we've got to get the virus under control. And that means, just as Joe Biden has said, we've got to let the science, the scientists in the docs set the policy. Over in Maryland and D.C., you have less than five minutes to cast your ballot. If you're in line, though, you can still vote. The polls close at 8 o'clock. Gabe Cohen joins us now live from the Silver Spring Civic Building, where the polls are about to close. Are there people waiting there, Gabe? Well, Leslie, you know, as you said, the state has been saying as long as you're in line by 8 o'clock, you are going to get to vote. But the story here in Montgomery County, there hasn't been a line. And many of these places look around. They are just processing those last few voters. And then at 8 o'clock, assuming nobody is in line at that point, they're going to start breaking everything down here, closing up and packing up. And at that point, I want to show you, they're going to be taking memory sticks from these scanners that are along the wall. That's what's actually holding the vote totals from today and they're gonna be driving them, a bipartisan team, to the, uh, the local um, uh, elections office, I should say, within the county, and then that information is gonna be transferred to the state level. They'll be the ones actually putting out those totals, but none of those totals, as we've been saying, will be released until every one of these polling locations around Maryland is shut down. Leslie? Fascinating to see in this era of COVID. We will be back with another local update, but before we do that, we're going to go to our colleague Adam Longo. Ads, you've been watching the numbers and you wanted to talk about what's happening in D.C. Sure, and we'll come to D.C. in just a second, but first I want to focus on where we actually have results coming in, Leslie, and that is Virginia, specifically our counties up here in northern Virginia. D.C. polls just about on the verge of closing, so we don't have any numbers to, to report and share with you yet. We'll do that uh, as soon as our next hit comes. So as you look at this map here, you're going to see a whole whole cascade of colors, right? The deeper colors, the more heavy Republican, the darker blue colors, the more heavy uh, Democratic. So as we're going to come in here, we're going to get some numbers. This is Fairfax County. You can see with only 2% of precincts reporting, we've got uh, Joe Biden ahead with 51%. But let's go into deep blue Arlington. You could see Joe Biden with a heavy lead there. This despite the fact uh, Virginia has actually already been called for Joe Biden. He is the winner uh, of that state's uh, electoral votes. The other states that have been called for Joe Biden definitively right now, including Vermont. Back to you. That's right. We'll be back with another local update in a half hour. We're going to send you back to our CBS coverage right now. Our local coverage continues online at WUSA9.com and the WUSA9 app. See you there.
Good evening, I'm Leslie Foster, continuing WUSA 9's election night coverage on this special digital show. And I'm Lorenzo Hall. While CBS News handles our coverage on TV, we have you covered with local races and, of course, the big contest of the night. And right now, Maryland and D.C., the polls just closed at 8 o'clock, and we're already getting some results in Virginia. We have a team of reporters ready to get you those stories you won't see anywhere else. Now, of course, all eyes are on the race for the White House today. Former Vice President Joe Biden spent Election Day in one of the biggest swing states of the night, Pennsylvania. He'll be giving a speech from Wilmington, Delaware later tonight. And President Trump spoke with his campaign workers at, its, at his headquarters in Arlington. He's expected to speak from the White House a little later tonight as well. All right, here at the studio, Adam Longo is at our big board tracking the close races and getting some information in right now. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to share with you some information about D.C. in just a moment. But first, I want to take you to the full picture of the electoral map as it stands right now. The Associated Press has called several states for each candidate so far, and here's what they are. If you take a look at this, these deep colors you see are the states that have been called for President Trump. Just now, South Carolina and its nine electoral votes going to President Trump. He already has banked Kentucky and West Virginia. Virginia has been called for Joe Biden, as has Vermont. Now, I want to take you in and show you what some of our capabilities are here with this throughout the night. So I've talked about D.C., or rather I've talked about Maryland and Virginia as we've moved through the night, but we haven't necessarily talked about D.C. yet and what I'm able to show you here. So in D.C., you can see how uh, the, the district is broken out by ward. So I'm going to be able to show you a couple of different things here. So specifically, when we talk about a large African-American communities, obviously D.C. has that more so, of course, in Ward 8 and then also more also Baltimore City in Maryland. So what I want to show you here real quick is just a breakdown of what Ward 8 did in 2016. OK, so Hillary Clinton, obviously the candidate in 2016, she took Ward 8 with 95.7 percent of the vote uh, to President Trump's 1.64 percent of the vote. So what I'm interested in seeing is once we start getting numbers from D.C., where are these numbers going to go? Because that's going to give us a glimpse into the electorate in other uh, densely populated African-American communities. And of course, across D.C., we saw much of the same thing in the, the various wards. In fact, uh, the ward that uh, Hillary Clinton did not win as great as all of the other ones was Ward 3, where she only got 85.6% of the vote, right? So I want to take you to Maryland and show you the similar thing in, in Baltimore City, right? So I'm going to take you through and show you the 2016 numbers uh, in Baltimore City. So 84.7% in 2016 uh, to President Trump, who came in with 10.5%. Uh, OK, so as I suspected, we've just gotten this information into us. Maryland has been called uh, for former Vice President Joe Biden, along with Rhode Island, Connecticut and Massachusetts. All right, so states that were deep blue that we suspected would go deep blue. Maryland, with having all of those mail-in ballots counted ahead of time. President Trump, we're also being told, has won uh, the red state of Oklahoma. Really no surprise there. And Tennessee as well, another red state for President Trump. So the reason that I wanted to highlight both Ward 8, D.C., and Baltimore City is to this fact, right? President Trump has made it a theme of his campaign speeches saying that he has done, Biden has won his home state of Delaware as well, we're getting the information. President Trump saying that he has done more for African Americans in this country than any other president except possibly Abraham Lincoln. So that's been one of his closing arguments that he's been on the road with. So what I'm very interested in seeing is where these numbers go throughout the night. If voters in Baltimore City overwhelmingly reject that argument and we see them voting in much higher numbers for former Vice President Biden, we will know that that is something that they were not believing from President Trump on the campaign trail. So back to the main uh, map real quick. I just want to take you through some of the other things you are literally hearing states called as I've been talking and what we've seen as those states have been called Alabama, Tennessee. We know Kentucky and West Virginia, South Carolina for President Trump. And then we heard a number of states, a cascade of them come in. Uh, it's not going to let me turn uh, Maryland blue because we feed that. What were these states for um, for Joe Biden again? We heard some in the Northeast as well, right, guys? Yeah, Vermont. Yeah, Vermont. Vermont, Rhode Vermont, Island, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Connecticut, right. So I just want to give you a look of what, of course, Virginia as well. What was that other one, Katrina? Massachusetts as well, right? So this is going to give us a picture of the electoral map as it stands right now. Very early on, just getting this information that Joe Biden has now won New Jersey as well. So add that to the 10 electoral votes he'll have from Maryland that 
Uh, there we go right there. So uh, Joe Biden uh, in the lead, and this is not including Virginia, so you can add 13 to that total. Uh, Joe Biden with an early electoral lead right now. Also waiting for Florida to update. We're closely watching Florida because as it is a key battleground swing state, about 81% of precincts reporting in Florida right now, and it is very close. At last check, as close as 9,000 votes. Biden wins Illinois. Here's another uh, addition to uh, the electoral map that we can add. So you can see Joe Biden. Look, these are states that were not very much of a contest. We sort of knew going in what these were going to be. I mean, fast forward to three hours from now when we know we're going to be able to fill in California, Oregon and Washington. Uh, we'll likely be able to you know, fill in these states for President Trump right through here. Oklahoma, I heard we call, you know, give him Arkansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Utah. You can see how the electoral map starts to expand. We'll be checking on that throughout the night. All right, it's still early. Thank you, Adam. It is. We're going to go to Calvert County, Maryland, where we saw thousands of you waiting in line today to cast your ballot. Check out this line outside of Northern High School. The big question there is why did so many people wait until today to vote? It is a sign that some voters say points to a wave of red voters that could turn the tide in many areas. Here's what one voter said about today's turnout. I think it's a conservative county. I think there was uh, people that wanted to make sure that their vote was counted. I think there's probably a lot of people who aren't as concerned about the virus as they should be. And I also think there's a lot of interest in the election. You know, people want to make sure that they are voting for their candidate and that their vote is being counted. So I'm hoping it's a good thing. Here's some important context, though. County officials say there are fewer voting locations there in years past. A decision officials say was made because many of the county's election judges are in the high risk group, and that could also add to today's long lines. As polls are now just getting ready to close in Maryland, I want to bring in our Gabe Cohen. He's been talking to voters in Silver Spring tonight, but uh, quite honestly, Gabe, you haven't had a ton to talk to because it's been pretty slow where you are. Yeah, Leslie, that's right. Officials told us across the state, including here locally, they didn't really know what to expect because this is really an unprecedented election. Certainly the conditions surrounding voting were going to be unprecedented. But as you can see behind me, they're shutting down. They are breaking everything down. If anyone had been in line at 8 o'clock, they would still be processing people. They were prepared to have those lines and to still be processing voters. But there was nobody in line at 8 o'clock. So now they're breaking everything down. They're going to be out of this room tonight. And once they have packed everything up, that is when they're going to take the memory sticks that are inside some of the scanners along the walls of this room. And they're going to actually drive those scanners, a bipartisan team, to the county elections office. They're going to be put in a computer there, and then they're going to be transferred to the state level. And the state will then be the ones that are actually putting that information out. Now, of course, we don't have final numbers on voter turnout. We might have to wait quite some time to have those numbers here in Maryland, but we can give you a little preview. As of 6.30, Maryland, we talked to their elections officials. They said they were seeing a 68% turnout. We crunched those numbers. That compares to a 72% turnout back in 2016. But again, there are still a lot of votes to be counted. That was with an hour and a half still left in in-person voting. It's not including any of the mail-in, the drop box ballots that are sitting outside right now that are being loaded up and are going to be counted as well, as well as any mail-in votes uh, that come in in the coming days. So again, still many to be counted, but I can tell you we were hearing cheers just a couple minutes ago because the staff that has been working so hard here, I think they're excited to see the process coming to a conclusion. Again, as you can see, they're packing up this location. Soon the rest of the votes will be taken to the county level, soon to the state level and then we'll hopefully get those results. Leslie? You know what, so much gratitude. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Gabe, for the poll workers really around the country who are putting their own health at risk in some way to ensure that we're all able to uphold our democracy. So round of applause for them, and, and please pass on our gratitude for a job very well done. So? Yeah, so many people stepped up despite that big risk. You're right there, Les. And you know, here's another reason why this election is so different. Lots of demonstrators out in D.C. tonight. You're looking at a large group down at Black Lives Matter Plaza in downtown D.C., a live look there. Of course, this has been a site where many people have expressed themselves prior to going to the ballot box today. Now, everything is calmed down there right now, but a lot of businesses have boarded up just in case because of what we've seen in the past. Our John Henry is live out there tonight. And uh, what's been the mood down there, John? What are people telling you? 
You know, it's very calm and peaceful down here. We've got hundreds of people who are out here at Black Lives Matter Plaza, as you said. It's pretty packed. But, you know, as you were saying, a lot of businesses and uh, office buildings are boarded up around here. There was some concern we could have instances of vandalism like we saw at some other the protests earlier this summer. But none of that. It's been very festive here today. There are bands, even a traveling go-go bus that we've seen in this part of the downtown portion of the district. D.C. Police Chief Peter Newsham told us his department has an enhanced presence out, but they're hoping for the best. Now, this crowd is overwhelmingly liberal. Remember, D.C. went 96 to 4 for Hillary Clinton over Trump four years ago. But I asked people here in the crowd, how did they vote and why are they here? Is it to support a Biden-Harris ticket or oppose the Trump-Pence ticket? Everyone I spoke to said the former. They're hopeful a Biden-Harris ticket, if elected, will usher in change. I think comes we need that change. The last four years have really impacted our country. Aspire for Biden, and we're so lucky as Americans to be able to have him on the ballot because he truly is phenomenal. And I believe that Joe Biden can finish what Obama started. Now, we have yet to run into any Trump supporters out here on the plaza, but we've run into a good share of out-of-towners, including one of the families we just showed you. They came all the way from McAllen, Texas, to be here. They said they felt there was no better place to be on Election Day than right here in the nation's capital. Lorenzo and Leslie? Hey, John, really quickly, we know the, uh, the results won't be final tonight, so are these demonstrators telling you what their plans are for later this evening or how long they're going to stay out there? Yeah, you know, a lot of people plan to be out here past midnight. Uh, really, uh, we're actually seeing a couple of people on their phones right now as some of the projections have been coming through. And I'm not sure if it's really up there or if you can see it behind that tree, but uh, there have been uh, rolling projections of some of the networks, uh, their newscasts on that building wall. So people are still keeping in touch with, you know, what's going on when it comes to ballot counting and projections. But yeah, a lot of people plan to be out here throughout the night. Uh, this gathering uh, is going to be here for quite some time. All right, John Henry there, Black Lives Matter Plaza. Thank you, John. All right, Arizona is a key battleground state for the candidates. Like much of the country, voters there were out in full force. This is a look at the lines in Scottsdale. Polls there close in a little under an hour. President Trump won Arizona by a slim margin back in 2016 by just three points. And the recent polls have shown the president and Joe Biden neck and neck. Nyella Charles joins us now near Phoenix with some of the biggest lines in Surprise, Arizona. That is quite a name and maybe in some ways the sentiment for a lot of folks. Surprise that Arizona is is going to potentially be a decisive battleground there. What are folks telling you? Well, the true surprise will be for both President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden, because like you said, here in Arizona, they are neck and neck to neck in the polls, and that's despite their best efforts to gain ground over each other. We've seen both campaigns here within the last several weeks, even the last several days. Here in Surprise, polls close in about an hour. You can see lines here or out the door, and today voters will decide who they think is the best candidate. This been running from himself. While waiting to vote in the hot sun, voters near Phoenix are getting some relief from the Joy to the Polls ban. Ooh. Lines here are the longest in Maricopa County, the state's largest county, where President Trump won by four points in 2016. This woman says she's been waiting for more than an hour. Our votes count, so if you have any anything that you don't like about what's going on, then you need to vote. For this veteran couple, the long wait is a privilege. It doesn't matter how long it's going to be, you have to do it. I mean, that's our job. Over in Tolleson, an area that is in the middle of a coronavirus surge, the virus is top of mind. At Esther Angelo Community Center, people can vote and take a COVID test, like Trez Simpson did. Just being safe, I know people who have come down with this, people very close to me. Whoever I feel would, would handle it better would be the automatic person. I just have to wonder if Biden would. Others are choosing the candidate they feel will loosen COVID restrictions. For me, it's, it's about returning back to a normal America. Howell says for her, that's the president. Showing that as coronavirus lingers as a part of our lives, its influence is even looming over the voting booth.
You're taking a live look at voters as they make their way into the precinct to vote again. The polls here close in an hour and as the final counts come in, we'll see if the record breaking early voting numbers that we've seen continue here at the polls. For now, we're live in surprise. Nyella Charles, back to you, Leslie. All right, Nyella, thanks so much. First. OK, continuing our coverage now right here in the studio, I want to bring in Michael Fontroy, Dr. Michael Fontroy. He want to bring him into the conversation. Political analyst, political science professor at Howard University here in Washington. He joins us via Zoom. Uh, Michael, are you there? Not yet. We're not done counting yet. We come back out, although that leave now 163,000. Just in the course of this conversation, President Trump is stretching. Adam, we're going to go to you. We've got issues with this. All right, we'll get that worked out, and I want to take you through because we're getting a lot of results here from our electoral map right now. So as you can see from the Associated Press calling some of the races, here's how the electoral math shakes out right now. Former Vice President Biden, 85 electoral votes. President Trump, 66. And if I hit that again, it's going to show us the percentage of the popular vote nationwide that has been counted uh, thus far. You can see just a narrow lead uh, President Trump holding there. What I want to do here is I want to fill out this electoral map a little bit more and just sort of game out some scenarios. As you can see, as is every four years, look, Florida, the battleground, 67% of precincts reporting uh, President Trump holding a narrow lead right now. Of course, Remember, Florida split, split into two time zones, right? So the panhandle of Florida coming right through here, those polls actually close at 8 o'clock. So the numbers are slowly coming in from this area of the state where we've got more numbers coming in right now from that part of the state. All right, so that's Florida, 29 electoral votes. We know that Florida is going to be key to this whole thing. Of course, if we were to plug in some of the other states that we suspect the candidates to win, and then I want you to take a closer look at the electoral math, right? So we're going to go ahead and just hand, not Colorado, we're going to hand the Midwest uh, to President Trump, some of these key states uh, through the South as well. And then we'll go ahead and give Joe Biden uh, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, um, and these states uh, up here, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Vermont has been called for him. Uh, Virginia, he has uh, his home state of Delaware. Come on, light up, little guy. All right. So anyway, so these are the these are the states that we're seeing. Of course, the West Coast states as well. Um, and then these are the key states that are going to be outstanding that we're going to be watching right, of course, all night. These states. Uh, like Nevada, Arizona, who we just heard from. I mean, this could be one of the deciding votes. Pennsylvania is key because Pennsylvania wasn't allowed to start counting these mail-in and absentee ballots until yesterday. Could be a few days before we have answers on Pennsylvania. Leslie? All right, ads. So there is no question most of the D.C. metro area is solidly blue, but of course it hasn't always been that way. Virginia was once a Republican stronghold, but the Dems have been chipping, chipping, chipping away at that. Our Mike Valerio joins us now live in Loudoun County tonight for some context. And really, Mike, Loudoun County is one of the biggest examples of that switch from red to blue. Right, I think you're absolutely right there, Leslie. Those days are done of Republicans having a reliable electoral count in Virginia. And one of the ways that so dramatically illustrates that change, as you mentioned right there, is Loudoun County and its shift under Republican leadership. Um, as we as we talk about congressional seats, uh, its congressional uh, delegate from 1980 all the way up until 2018. And to illustrate that, these are the races that really come into focus. So before even... President Trump's comes into picture 2014. We have Barbara Comstock winning her race. The Republican, of course, the stalwart Republican DC fixture by 16 percentage points. As soon as Trump gets on the ballot and Barbara Comstock again from the Republican Party is running with Donald Trump, she wins her race by six percentage points. But then, Leslie, of course, we get to the blue wave 2018. Wexton takes the seat, takes it by 12 percentage points. And bottom line, Democrats are hoping that this similar pattern plays out with demographic changes, with more diversity in these areas, and also with anti-Trump sentiment, that a similar playbook can take place, can really play itself out in states like Texas, Georgia, and Arizona. But we want to take a listen from uh, a voter named Hannah we listened to about what she thinks about the changes in her home of Loudoun. Take a listen to what she told us earlier today. Change is always necessary. I absolutely support it. Those who might have been partial to one party have now maybe made some impacting decisions to change. 
Okay, so Jennifer Wexton is again the Democratic candidate who is up for re-election seeking a second term. Alicia Andrews is her Republican opponent. Sterling credentials for both of these candidates. For those who don't know, Alicia Andrews, a former Marine. Cybersecurity is her background. We all know Jennifer Wexton from that bitter Comstock Wexton contest two years ago. But it seems as though Alicia Andrews, Leslie, is going to have such a tough time decoupling herself from Donald Trump, and she is expected to lose this race. Leslie? All right, we'll see what happens, Mike. Thank you. All right, we're glad you're with us for this expanded digital coverage as America decides. Right now, we're going to take a brief pause to get ready for a five minute news cut in on television. Don't go anywhere. We're going to keep updating you on your screen. Stay with us for our special coverage. We'll continue in just a few minutes. This is a WUSA 9 update on election night here in D.C., Maryland and Virginia. Good evening, I'm Leslie Foster. The polls are now closed in D.C., Maryland, Virginia and West Virginia. But take a look at this line. Sky 9 is over Northern High School in Calvert County, where voters are still waiting to cast their ballots. These people were in line at 8 p.m., so they will be allowed to vote. Now we've seen some long lines like this at this location all day. Our Colby Satterfield is there. The last voters are making their way in to cast their ballots tonight here in Calvert County, where the line has been long, and I mean long all day long. Voters report waiting in line upwards of two hours to cast their ballot. While voters were waiting, I talked with them about why they waited until today to vote. Many told me they didn't trust the mail-in process, and many told me they were voting Republican. 
which also reflects voter turnout numbers I obtained from county officials. Whereas of just before four this afternoon, Republican voters nearly tripled those of Democratic. But the sea of red isn't the only reason we could be seeing lines like this out here in Calvert County. Officials tell me they have cut their polling places from 23 in previous years to four this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. In Calvert County, Colby Satterfield, WUSA 9. All right, and crowds continue to gather at Black Matter Plaza, Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House in anticipation of tonight's election results. Several groups of people are down there. Among them is shut down D.C., and they are an anti-group, anti-Trump group. Black Lives Matter Plaza has become a gathering point for protesters who support a change in administration, and this election night is no different. Our John Henry is down there and joins us now live. John, what are you hearing? Hey, Leslie. Yeah, it's a pretty packed house here at Black Lives Matter Plaza. There are hundreds of people here on 16th Street and K Street uh, down this corner, including a large police presence, as you can see, too. So far, things have been pretty peaceful down here, if not times festive. This crowd, many of whom support Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, have told us they are hopeful they could see big change tonight in the Oval Office. Now, leading up to, to tonight, much of the downtown area decided to board up in advance of any possible vandalism. We've seen nothing like that so far. And the D.C. Chief of Police, Peter Newsham, says he hopes things stay that way. Uh, the entire police department is working. Uh, Metropolitan Police Department is one of the best in the country at handling large crowds. Uh, and we ask people the same thing every time we have a large crowd like this. Uh, if you're coming down here to exercise your First Amendment right, uh, we welcome you. Uh, we're going to assist you in any way that we can. Uh, if you come down here with the intention of committing violence or hurting somebody, uh, we have a responsibility and we're going to have to take you into custody. We haven't seen any big dust ups between police or the people out here. On top of that, the police presence once again is very heavy. Roads are blocked off in a blocks in every direction in this area. With the very latest from Black Lives Matter Plaza, John Henry, W USA 9. All right, John, thank you. DC is just being called uh, by CBS for Biden. So we're getting another update here at ADGE. You've got your eyes on the national map and some Senate races, too. Yeah, that's right. We're getting a good look at some of the other battleground states. Texas, can you imagine being a battleground state? Look here, 24% of precincts reporting Joe Biden actually ahead in Texas, which is something you wouldn't expect. Uh, and to the Senate map right now, we'll focus again on Texas. MJ Hagar uh, against uh, the majority whip in the Senate, John Cornyn, who's the incumbent. A very close race right there. A couple of uh, races uh, very close as well, including South South Carolina or with uh, with Lindsey Graham, the incumbent. All right, we'll be back with another local update for you in a half hour. We're going to send you back to CBS News coverage now, and we will be online at WUSA9.com and our WUSA9 app.
I us hear you. For WUSA 9 special coverage of election night, we are following results as they come on in. Oh yeah, let's get to the big ones in our area. The Associated Press already called D.C., Virginia, and Maryland for Vice President Joe Biden. West Virginia went to President Trump. Now on the national stage, we're still waiting on results from some big swing states that could decide this election. Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, and Ohio still haven't called their races yet. I'm Bruce Johnson continuing our coverage here in the studio. I want to bring in Dr. Michael Farnbury right now into this conversation, political analyst, political science professor at Howard University. Michael, thanks for joining us. Let's go right to Florida. Uh, I heard Joe Biden say this afternoon that if he won Florida, it's all over. He becomes, you know, the new president. It doesn't look that good for Joe Biden tonight, correct? No, not at this point. Uh, Florida has done a, what appears to be a really good job in getting the votes counted relatively quickly. And at least at this point, it looks like Vice President Biden's going to come up a little short. And part of that is because he's underperforming in Miami-Dade County uh, the, uh, relative to what Secretary Clinton did in 2016. She got 66% of the vote in Miami-Dade right now. At this point, Vice President Biden is about 55%. And this is really interesting in part because Vice President Biden is doing better than Secretary Clinton did in some other parts of the state. So if he could somehow pull out Miami-Dade, then he has a chance. But otherwise, it looks like President Trump is going to keep it in his column. Okay, you told me uh, in exchanging text messages, uh, you, you find what's going on in Ohio surprising. What are we talking about there? Yeah, there's, there's some, some evidence that in, in some of the counties that President Trump won four years ago along the Pennsylvania border, and in some of the suburban Cleveland counties, those counties are actually going for Vice President Biden at this point. And if those numbers hold, I think it's going to be really difficult for President Trump to win Ohio. And that's notable because no Republican has won the White House in nearly a century without winning Ohio. And so that would be a bellwether and might also have some impact on what goes on in Pennsylvania and Michigan, even though we're talking about different states, often states in a particular region tend to vote similarly. So if Ohio ends up going to uh, Vice President Biden, then that might also mean the same for Pennsylvania. Yeah, still far too early to tell. What about Georgia? Uh, you know, the Biden campaign was talking about Georgia. I got a lot of people excited. It doesn't appear to be happening right now. No, Georgia is a lot like Florida. You know, uh, states that are transitioning in terms of their demography and are more attractive to uh, Democrats than they had been in previous years, but may not actually yet be there. It looks like uh, Florida, at least at this point, is a little out of reach of the Democrats. Uh, but, but at the same time, uh, you look at a state nearby, not far away, like North Carolina, and it could actually go to the vice president. And so we're, see we're still very early in the evening. We're early enough in the evening where we're seeing these these uh, trends moving in one direction or another. Uh, but uh, Georgia and Florida, at least at this point, appear to be in the uh, President Trump's column. Okay, closing question. Uh, surprises. Are you surprised by what you've seen thus far? Uh, Trump supporters are going to be telling me, I told you so. And number one, it's very difficult to unseat an incumbent anyway. It doesn't happen that often. I can think of Carter. I can think of uh, uh, Bush, the father. So it's very difficult. But Trump's people are telling us all along they will turn out, there will be surges, and they'll be able to match those mail-in ballots. Is that holding true? Uh, well, yes, but let's remember, and, and not every state even does mail-in. So, you know, these so-called hidden Trump voters uh, may not be so hidden. They, they came out today, which was expected, and Democrats were expected to dominate the early vote in, in the states in which it, it happens. Uh, but again, um, if... Vice President Biden wins Pennsylvania, for example, those Trump voters that are talking about, I told you so in Florida and Georgia, you know, you're really just holding serve on states that you were, uh, that you won last time. And so uh, the, the, the race doesn't really start until President Trump loses a state that he didn't expect, that he, that he expected to keep. And we're not yet there. Yeah, I was just, just going to say, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, Biden can win without Florida. He can win, well, in some scenarios, he can win without Pennsylvania, but he's got to pick up something out west, right? At least one state? Yeah, he's got to get Arizona. You know, needs to have Nevada. Yeah, but, but again, if he wins Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, then there's really no viable path to, to re-election for President Trump. Yeah, I uh, can't help but note, uh, 
Joe Biden, last stop he made today was uh, in Pennsylvania. Is he worried about Pennsylvania? Should he be? I'm sure they have some internal numbers telling them that it's going to be very close. Uh, but, uh, but you know, he, he, he's as well positioned to win Pennsylvania as any recent Democrat. Yeah. What, what about turnout here? Uh, any group not show up? Uh, what about African-Americans in the urban areas? Miami-Dade that you were just talking about. Uh, right. uh, uh, did they turn out or, or African-American males in particular? Trump really went after that group, trying mm -hmm. to suppress that group. Uh, and he also went after the Hispanic vote, you know, you know, to do better with that group. What, what, right. What's happening in those areas? So I would just say generally, the, there's a really good story to be told in terms of turnout and excitement for, for the election. It looks like they're going to be about 20 million more votes this time than four years ago, uh, just sort of as a political observer, political scientist. That's really big. Now, as you drill down into that, though, uh, Miami-Dade, it, it appears that uh, Cuban voters uh, went really hard on the, the anti-socialism anti piece that President Trump emphasized. And so he is doing better with uh, Latinx voters in Florida. Uh, and as it relates to African-American voters, I think it's a little early to tell. Yes, President Trump went after them hard, but he got 9% overall in 2016. I'm going to be really surprised if the number is substantially better than that. It all depends on where these votes are being cast. I would keep an eye on the black vote in Georgia. I think that's really important. And uh, also in Orlando, Tampa, and places like that. Yeah. We're going to be up all night and what? Part of tomorrow? Uh, and part of the next day. And perhaps part of the next day. Okay. I think we're going to be in for a long, a long uh, period of counting right. and then litigation around the counting. Exactly. Dr. Michael Fonroy, Howard University. Thanks a lot, Michael. Adam, let's go to you. Yeah, and Bruce, let's drill down on some of those states that Dr. Fontroy was just talking about. I think the key state in all of that discussion was Pennsylvania, and the key thing about Pennsylvania is because they didn't start counting all of those early absentee ballots until yesterday, it's going to take some time. In Maryland, they've been doing it for weeks, right? But that's one of the reasons why we don't expect Pennsylvania, with it being so close, to being called tonight. But let's talk about the states that Dr. Fontray was just talking about. For, for instance, Ohio. Actually, let me reset first. Looking at this national map right now, you don't see any surprises on here, with the exception of, I mean, they've got 1% in Kansas, and right now Joe Biden happens to be in the lead. So expect Kansas, obviously, to flip from blue to red. But the rest of this map, uh, the, it was, we knew it was going to be close in Florida. In Ohio, the polls were trending close, but it looked like it was leaning more towards President Trump. We only have 1% reporting right now, but you can see that Joe Biden uh, does have a lead in Ohio. We were talking about Georgia as well. We've got 10% reporting. This was a state that Democrats really went after, thinking this is, this is one that isn't really a battleground state that we can turn competitive. And they've done that. They've closed the gap. 10% reporting right now wouldn't reflect that results. Where it would reflect it, however, is in some of the Senate results that we're seeing so far. So you've got a regularly scheduled Senate race in Georgia right now. Uh, that a Republican is trying to hold on to. David Perdue, who's the incumbent against uh, investigative journalist John Ossoff. You can see 9% reporting. Perdue has actually taken a pretty healthy lead. Uh, and then there's a special election in Georgia for uh, retiring Senator Johnny Isaacson's seat. Kelly Leffler, who's the incumbent, who was appointed by the governor two years ago, is at 30%. The Democrat, Raphael Warnock, at 28 And Doug Collins, who's another Republican. This is the Republican that President Trump endorsed and was hoping that the governor in Georgia would appoint instead of appointing Leffler. Here's the key thing about this whole race. This is going to go to a runoff election. This election will not be decided tonight, and here's why. Because in Georgia, all of the Senate races have to be won by 50% of the vote plus one. You've got two Republicans splitting that vote and one Democrat. No one's here going to get to 50%. This race will not be decided tonight. This race uh, involving uh, David Perdue and John Ossoff, depending on how these results go. Again, if neither of them get to 50%, if Perdue drops down, that'll be a second runoff election we would see in Georgia. Another one that we're watching closely is the Senate race in South Carolina. Jamie Harrison uh, closing within just a couple of percentage points of uh, the incumbent Senator Lindsey Graham there with 12 percent of the precincts reporting. As we zoom back out to the national map real quick, just want to take you through. Look, they have turned Texas blue at this point, right? So let's go into Texas. We've got 30 percent of precincts reporting. Again, we don't know what precincts are outstanding. Texas, a heavily red state, but right now split evenly only by a matter of about 7,000 votes, less. All right.
Let's go to D.C. and stick with our WUSA 9 reporter Delia Gonsal to find out more about what she's seeing. Uh, the polls have uh, uh, have closed in D.C. Polls have been closed for 40 minutes and it is going to be an early night for these election workers because the joint has cleared out. We are here live at the Super Center at Union Market. Again, it's been 40 minutes since the polls officially closed and the official, uh, the workers here, the volunteers, the election workers have cleared out. You can see the ballot machines have been shut down. The receipts have been collected. All they need to do at this point is open up each of these lock boxes and take out the physical ballots that are inside. But, you know, the folks that we talked to today who did come out to vote said there was a good reason for them to come out today. So let's take a look at some video um, that we shot. We really went to polling places all over the city in all eight wards. In fact, the election captain over at Horace Mann Elementary School in Ward 3, get this, reported only 50 voters in the first six hours. So slow and steady was the theme across the board. And uh, we saw very few crowds, no tech issues, no long lines. The story here, the massive early voter turnout. So we're talking mail-in, drop boxes, and early in-person voting. The D.C. Board of Elections collected more than 282,000 ballots. And get this, that is nearly the total district-wide voter turnout in 2016. Still, we caught up with some folks who came out, including a grandmother who brought her granddaughters. Take a listen. I explained to them that their vote counts and it's important. So your vote may be that one vote that's needed to make the country <laughs> better. So the kids can go to school, so there can be a vaccine, so we can get to some type of normalcy. I voted today because it's bigger than me at this point. Uh, this is to lay the foundation for my kids when I have kids that, okay, I voted when I was 21 years old and so now they'll have to vote and so I feel like today was today was the good day uh, for me and my family. Voting certainly was a family affair even when you came in uh, everyone broke out into applause after each and every vote was uh, counted and each ballot cast here at the uh, voting center and we really saw that throughout all the voting centers here in the district 32 in fact uh, the polls close at 8 o'clock. I just talked to the D.C. Board of Elections. They are tallying all the numbers and they're expecting to release some early numbers in just a few moments. So we're going to keep our eye on the D.C. Board of Elections website to see how things are shaking out so far. But an earlier wrap up to the night than anticipated in 2016 for that general election. The early numbers didn't really come out until well after nine o'clock, according to the D.C. Board of Elections uh, data and their website. So we're in good shape here in D.C., and it's going to be an early night for these election workers. Back to you in the studio. All right. I'm sure they are feeling relieved, at least, that, that this part of the journey is over. And we're grateful for them, Delia. Thank you. Of course, a candidate needs 270 electoral votes to win the presidency, and these battleground states will decide the election this year. But results may have to wait. In Arizona, Florida, and Minnesota, mail ballots can be counted before Election Day. So, again, we're expecting these results to come quickly. But in North Carolina and Ohio, ballots cannot be counted until Election Day. But early in-person voting can be quickly tabulated, so the results from those states could be known election night. But again, there's no guarantee. Did you guys understand that? Okay. In Georgia, election <laughs> officials are predicting results in one to two days if the race is close. And Pennsylvania results, well, we might not get those until the weekend. That would be five days after the election. That's why we keep saying patience. In Michigan, they're saying results could take up to three days. Patience, patience, patience. We got it. Every state has a different policy too there as we're, uh, we're all learning. And you know, Michigan will once again be a big state in this election. It's going to play a pivotal role. President Trump had his final rally of the campaign season in Grand Rapids last night. That's the same place he ended his rallies in 2016. Joining us live now is Elena Holland in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, what's the mood out there right now, Elena? Well, hi, good evening. So the polls just closed about 45 minutes ago. We're still waiting for those results. As you mentioned, it's going to be some time. 
But as of right now, at last check, more than 10, nearly 10,000 more voters have voted in this election here just in Grand Rapids City than they did in the presidential election in 2016. Now here at City Hall, people are still inside waiting in line to register and vote. That's because Michigan has same day voter registration. So as long as someone is in line at 8 p.m., they can still register and vote on Election Day. We spoke with some poll challengers today who said across the county they didn't encounter any major issues, specifically with voter intimidation across the county. However, many polling locations did see representatives from a petition to recall Governor Gretchen Whitmer collecting signatures from voters as they left the polls. They were outside the 10 or 100 foot uh, distance that they needed to be from the polls, so they were allowed to be there. Once again, it's going to be some time before we see results here in Michigan. The city clerk here in Grand Rapids said Election Day is a lot like the Super Bowl. This year, it's like the World Series. It's going to take some time to count those record breaking number of absentee ballots in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Elena Holland, let's send things back over to you. All right, thanks so much. So all right, Les, the polls closed in D.C. at 8 o'clock, 46 minutes ago. So how did voting go in our nation's capital? While well, we saw lines wrapped around polling places in a lot of states, including Maryland and Virginia, it stayed relatively calm in D.C. We saw a lot of this. What you're looking at here, short lines, people just strolling in, casting their votes, and walking right on out. Joining us right now is D.C. Board of Elections Chair Dr. Michael Bennett. Dr. Bennett, thank you for being here with us on this busy night. Well, there we go. Look, looks like we lost him there. Adam, if we can go over to you <laughs> yeah. to give us, an, uh, give us an, an idea of how this uh, map is being filled in right now, how this race is going. Okay, so sure, we're getting uh, results come in sort of uh, a lot more quickly now. So uh, as we look at the national map here, so for instance, looking at Florida, 80% uh, of uh, the vote is in, and you can see that the two candidates, let me give my... Uh, little magic marker action going on here. Uh, the two candidates separated by about 200,000 votes so far. Now, here's the key thing. Florida started counting these mail-in ballots early, right? But of this 80%, we don't know what that is. We heard Dr. Fontroy from just a few minutes ago saying that things are uh, slow, kind of coming from the Miami-Dade region, so that would be a heavily Democratic region. The key thing for Joe Biden, what he would want here is he would want a heavier turnout for uh, Hispanic, African-American voters uh, in that area, right? So as we're coming back and looking at our national map uh, again, the wider shot, we want to get a glimpse of you know what's happening in Georgia as well. You know this is a state that President Trump won handily in 2016, with 12% of the precincts reporting uh, doing quite well there as well right now. In Texas, with 30% of the precincts reporting, you can see that there's a difference of about 93,000 votes between the two candidates. Expect that number to change as we move forward. Now let's drill down into some of our more uh, local races here too. Not local races, but our local counties as pertains to how they are voting right now in this election. One interesting thing that I learned from uh, texting with uh, WSA9's Mike Valerio, who's in Loudoun County tonight. So I want to give you a for instance of why this map is skewed at this point, because it's a very important distinction that you need to see. For instance, I'm going to focus on Loudoun County. Loudoun County says 96% of folks are reporting at this point. And if you live in Loudoun County, if you know the politics of Loudoun County, you're going, what are you talking about? Like th th that just can't be right. And it isn't. And here's why. Mike Valerio tells me that Loudoun County and some of the other counties in Virginia won't actually be re reporting the results of early voting ballots until about 11 o'clock tonight. All right. So these are heavily Democratic areas that voted ex in extreme numbers during early voting. But those numbers are not yet reflected in what you see here, despite the fact that it says 96 percent. So in Loudoun County, for instance, let me just take you through a split. So in 2016, hello now, come on. In 2016, the Democrat Hillary Clinton won Loudoun County 55.1% to President Trump's 38.2%. Uh, so you can see that's a pretty wide swing, very unlikely in four years. But again, once we get those early vote counts in, we're going to have a much better uh, understanding of what's actually playing out in Loudoun County, right? So uh, our other counties... The counties that we would expect to be uh, deep blue. I mean, look at Arlington right there, uh, Alexandria, uh, Fairfax as those numbers come in. One thing that I'm going to be keeping a close eye on, we're expecting numbers from Maryland 
any second. And we're going to be able to take you through county by county, Montgomery County, Prince George's County. How did you vote compared to four years ago? A ton of early voting, a ton of absentee ballots. How is that going to shake out for either candidate? Will they be doing much better or much worse than their party did four years ago? So. All right, thank you, Adam, and we're glad you're with us for this expanded digital coverage as America decides. Right now, we're going to take a brief pause to get ready for a five-minute news cut-in on television. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is a WUSA 9 update on election night here in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Good evening, I'm Leslie Foster. Presidential election winners have now been declared in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia, and there really are no surprises. So let's take a look first in D.C. Former Vice President Joe Biden has been declared the winner. The former Vice President has also won Maryland, and Biden has also defeated President Trump in Virginia. While over in West Virginia, President Trump has been declared the winner over Biden. Our Adam Longo is at the big board to show us how our local states are doing in the Electoral College and how you can follow along with us from home. Yeah, so one thing that we've been doing all night is we've been able to break out county by county, at least so far in Virginia, where we have results, how things are shaking out there. So, for instance, 41% of the vote in Fairfax County reporting uh, Joe Biden having won the state of Virginia, but, it's, but still able to compare how they did to four years ago. Now, one thing I want to show you here that's very interesting, something you'll be able to do as you follow along at home, because I know that you're working two screens at once, right? You're watching TV, you've got your phone with you. So on our WSA 9 app and our website, go to WSA9.com slash elections or on our app. The top of the page, it says elections results go there. You can type in here 
any key words here. So if you're looking for the psychedelic mushroom uh, ballot initiative in D.C., that's going to give you that. If you want to type in Montgomery County, right, so just type in Montgomery County, you'll be able to get Board of Election seats and the ballot questions as well. So these are things that you'll be able to keep a close eye on and be able to watch as your local race results are coming in. The national race results, of course, we're focusing on. But, of course, uh, Mayor of Leesburg, something that's up uh, in Loudoun County and a number of other races uh, around the region that we'll be keeping a close eye on. Les? All right. Crowds down at Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House are watching the results come in. Several groups of people are there, among them shut down D.C., which is decidedly anti-Trump. And Black Lives Matter Plaza has really become a gathering point for people who support a change in the administration. This election night is no different. Our Eric Flack is down there, and he joins us now live. So what's it feel like there? What's the atmosphere, Flack? <laughs> The atmosphere, I think, Leslie, is uh, subdued, uh, um, passionate, um, a small but, but passionate and motivated army of people down at the end of Black Lives Matter uh, Plaza right there uh, at Lafayette Square Park. Gathered, uh, chanting, uh, music is going, all pretty much united, as you mentioned, uh, in one goal. Uh, in their eyes, they want to see President Donald Trump voted out of office tonight. You'll see that there's a board, some live coverage over there, um, switching back and forth between the networks where they actually are watching results. I did ask some of the decidedly pro-Biden uh, onlookers, were they getting nervous with the tight race in Florida, uh, some of the tight races in other states? They said, yes, in fact, we are starting to get nervous. I said, well, at some point then, do you go back home to really focus on these results coming in? They said, no, we're staying right here because we think the tighter this gets, we think the more President Trump takes control of this election or stays in this election, the crazier things may get down here. We're going to be all here, down here all night, keeping an eye on it for you. Leslie? All right, Flack, they're waiting for results, and here are two of them. CBS News just called New York for Vice President Biden, and AP has called Indiana for President Trump. We'll be back, of course, with another local update for you in our next half hour, and we will send you back to CBS News coverage right now. Our local coverage, though, continues online at WUSA9.com and the WUSA9 app.
Good evening. Thank you for being here with us. I'm Lorenzo Hall, continuing WUSA 9's election night coverage on this special digital show. And I'm Bruce Johnson. Thanks for joining us. While CBS News handles our coverage on TV, we have you covered with local races and, of course, the big contest of the night. Results are pouring in right now. Tonight is all about the swing states, and Republicans are keeping their legal options open to challenge absentee ballots in states like Pennsylvania, haven't heard from them. And that's where a GOP congressional candidate is now suing to have mail-in ballots that had to be corrected by election officials thrown out. Joining me right now, Kim Whaley, constitutional uh, law professor at the University of Baltimore, also a legal analyst. Kim, thanks for joining us. Where are we gonna be going to court? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna assume Florida is gonna be in there somewhere and we haven't even heard from Pennsylvania and people are already putting Pennsylvania in the courtroom. Is that correct? Well, Pennsylvania has been in the courtroom multiple times already. And as you indicated, it really comes down to the narrow margins, margins of in the swing state. So if we have uh, strong margins in favor of one candidate over the other, it's less likely to go to court. If, if the votes tallies are very slim, like it looks like it's happening right now in Florida, for example, then we can get into legal battles about whether to count this ballot or not count that ballot. It'll be a ballot by ballot type legal challenge. Are you thinking hanging chats? Because that's what keeps going through my mind right about now. Well, I mean, a lot of the states after that debacle in 2000 changed their equipment. But that being said, the equipment is not foolproof. It's not consistent across the country. And a lot of the technology is in the hands of third party vendors. It's not even regulated by the government. So there certainly are plenty of opportunities for there to be errors, lots of places you can poke holes in it. And if people want to delay the election, delay the count, then, of course, we could get into a, you know, a huge mess come December if uh, if we don't actually have an, a, an, a ballot count in these swing states, then it could go to a contested election that could end up you know, in the United States Congress or even more confusing. Yeah, all the conversation has been about what Donald Trump might do, in part because he's the one talking about, you know, uh, 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 throwing all, all kind of die on this election. But what about the Democrats? Do they have any legal standing here? Do they have any legal complaints? Yeah, well, they certainly do. I mean, what happened in Bush versus Gore in 2000, the Supreme Court essentially said you have to tr treat all voters equally. You can't just do recounts of certain categories of voters and not of others. So that kind of equality principle potentially could be favorable to Democrats. I mean, it's good on both sides of the, of, of the spectrum. But traditionally, or at least in this particular election, it has been the Republican Party across the country that has been suing or taking positions in lawsuits to keep it access from people to have uh, keep people from having access to the ballot, just to, to make it harder to vote during, during a pandemic, to give reasons for basically striking ballots and Democrats have wanted to increase access. And my guess is that would continue uh, post post today, I guess, because the election's been now been going on for weeks. Yeah, if you look at what's going on right now, uh, today, people showing up to vote. I didn't see or hear about any problems. It looks like things were pretty smooth. I didn't see any voter intimidation or anything like that. What about you? Right. I mean, I think this is one of the silver linings, however tonight turns out, is that uh, we did not see, you know, violence at the polls. We have not seen crazy long lines. We have not seen machines break down. We have not seen at least heard about any sort of foreign interference in the system for counting votes. So that's a good thing. I think what it points to is the hard work of regular Americans that are on the front lines of democracy, working the polls and working the election system in a pandemic with not enough money. I mean, that moment you know, taking a snapshot of that is a beautiful thing for American democracy. And also it shows, you know, this massive voter turnout. People are taking seriously this precious gift that we have that is American democracy. And they learned, uh, we've all learned, but certainly the states have learned from the primaries over the summer what to avoid. So we're not seeing a lot of the problems that we saw over the summer. And that is absolutely a good thing. The high, high turnout is a good thing. And the smooth sailing is a good thing. Uh, we're just going to have to hope that that continues so we have a clear victor and we don't end up, you know, weeks and weeks in litigation and more trauma, frankly, on the, on the country around this election. Yeah, you know the law backwards and forward. Who are you most upset with? It seems to me you, you mentioned democracy. This was democracy at its best. I mean, from people showing up to vote in all kinds of different ways, uh, poll workers, 
uh, uh, people being very courteous, trying to get people in, making sure everybody was comfortable. And then, well, it still takes too long to vote in some places. I mean, standing in line for 10 hours in Georgia. But then it ends up in the courts. It, it ends up with, with, with a heavy foot, it seems like, on the electorate's neck. How do we fix this? Well, the United States Congress under the Constitution can pass legislation to just make things easier. I mean, a federal judge here in Washington, uh, Judge Sullivan, you know, issued a decision this week and indicated uh, basically against the Postal Service, telling the Postal Service they were they had lost or couldn't keep track of 300,000 ballots or pieces of mail. Judge Sullivan said, listen, you got to go back and find them. And he said, you know, listen, we all know that the date that we file our taxes. We all know certain deadlines and how to do things. There should be one way of doing voting and not make it so hard for voters. So Congress can absolutely fix that. The House of Representatives passed two bills um, under the new Democratic majority after 2018. They just haven't gone anywhere in the Senate. We just heard uh, Mitch McConnell, who's currently the Senate Majority Leader from Kentucky, was reelected. But of course, if the Senate goes to the Democrats, I think we will see some changes to the electoral system that were, are going to be designed to just make it easier for every American to vote. Because the way to win, win, a, win an election should not be keeping people from the polls. It should be on the issues. It should be on your policy. It should be give people something to vote for, uh, not try to keep them from being able to exercise their constitutional right. People fought and died for the right to vote. And we're talking yeah, about voters. Yeah, it's, it's tremendous. The history of it to, to requires us to honor that privilege. And I would hope if any of these disputes do go to the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court would respect that. But unfortunately, we're uh, with Amy Coney Barrett in particular on the court. A conservative court is unfortunately is not going to weigh the right to vote as heavily as maybe uh, the more progressive uh, justices on the court would do. That is, they'll justify infringements on the right to vote based on the, the rules are the rules, and we've seen that already. So I'm really hoping, Bruce, this doesn't go to the courts. This belongs squarely in the hands of the American people, not in unelected federal judges' chambers. Yeah, and the only way this doesn't go to the courts is if there's a clear, decisive win. Right? Absolutely, and this is why all eyes right now are on Florida. Without Florida, Donald Trump cannot, people say, very hard to get the 270 electoral votes because Florida has so many. So that's why people are paying attention to Florida and North Carolina, not because they're going to decide the election, but they could make things easier in that if Donald Trump doesn't win one of those states, it's just virtually impossible to, for him to get the 270 vote, uh, electoral votes and we could just go to sleep and know who's president. Um, if he does win one of those states or if it's narrow margins, then we're, you know, we're going to be up all night and potentially in a few days uh, still wondering. Pennsylvania, for example, takes longer and it's a it's considered a very critical state. So it's better for everyone to have less anxiety, less uncertainty. And again, uh, the other thing, five times in American history, uh, the uh, presidency went to someone who won the electoral co college vote, but lo uh, but lost the popular vote. That's also due to narrow margins. When we've got big margins, the electoral college functions just fine. It follows the popular vote. It's when we've got slim margins that the winner take all system, you get whoever wins the majority in a state gets all but two states, all of the electoral college votes. That's why we've got this disconnect. So again, the more the higher the voter turnout, the clearer the winner, the better it is, I think, for everyone. Yeah. Kim Whitley, and when you were talking about getting some rest, going to sleep, my crew looked at me and we're all thinking, you don't go to sleep tonight because we don't get to go to sleep tonight. <laughs> you know it, right? And we have a long day tomorrow, too. So get out that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Whitley, constitutional attorney. Thanks a lot, Kim. Adam? Always a pleasure. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, you know, Bruce, so there's an interesting and so there's an interesting dichotomy as how it works out with this board right now is about how you look at the states and how they're color coded. A lot of this is what we expected based on polling coming into this night. But when then you drill down on the numbers a little bit more, it's showing you some disparities, and that's because the outstanding votes, we don't know where they're coming from. Uh, you just heard her talk about Florida, right, and how that's an outstanding state right now, and how President Trump needs to win Florida in order to have a path to continue. If President Trump wins Florida, there are still a number of other states, for instance, the Great Lakes states that he's going to have to pull through and perhaps even Arizona, maybe even Nevada to hit to have his path to 270 electoral votes clear. So I want to take you through some of the states that are sort of in contest right now just to show you how many votes still have to come into the results and to look at the spread as they are right now. So we talked about Florida. Wait, I'm in the wrong setting here real quick. So let me turn this off and we're going to come in on Florida. 
90% of the vote reporting. Again, where's that 10% coming from? Is that early voting numbers? Is that the panhandle part of Florida where the, the polls closed an hour later than the rest of the state? But you could, as, as you can see right here, President Trump, 51% uh, to 48%, but that's a difference of some 300,000 and change votes. It would be a lot for uh, the former vice president to make up there. As we look at some of the other states that we thought might be uh, close races, Georgia, only 17%. So this 56% might not be a good, true and accurate representation of what the final ends up to be because look, we're only at 17%. One thing that's pretty interesting that we've been talking about leading up to election day is South Carolina, right? And South Carolina and voters and pollers thought that they might be closing the gap there. So as you can see here, about 35, 37,000 votes separating the two candidates with just 22% reporting. But then if we actually look at the Senate map and how that shakes out in South Carolina with the same amount of percentage of votes reporting, you can see uh, incumbent Senator Lindsey Graham holding about a 58,000 vote lead. All right, so that actually, uh, judging by the down ballot, would be very close to the presidential. So actually, let's go back to the presidential real quick and let's focus in on Texas because Texas has been a very interesting case study uh, during the 2020 election. As you can see, 37% of precincts reporting and uh, a former Vice President Biden with a lead of about 34,000 votes. I want to show you one more thing before I let you go, and that's West Virginia. All right, we knew West Virginia was going to go red, deep red for President Trump, right? But what I want to take you through is comparing how West Virginia is doing this year with how they did in 2016. So in 2016, President Trump took West Virginia with 67.9% of the vote and Hillary Clinton came away with 26 0.2%. So as this number, the number of votes reporting, as that number goes up, it goes up so high you can't even see the arrow anymore, right? We're going to see, is there going to be a bigger spread? Is West Virginia going to go more red than it did in 2016? Will President Trump's numbers go up? Or will there be a shrinking of that gap? And if that's the case, I think that's what you can look at and extrapolate that that could be the sentiment of voters in other similarly situated rural areas across the United States, we could see that gap close. So, all right. Thank you, Adam. You know, right now, just after nine o'clock, we are getting an update from Virginia's Board of Elections. The polls there closed about two hours ago. So far, we haven't heard reports of any issues in the Commonwealth, but let's listen in. They'll report uh, because they want to uh, ensure that they process the absentee ballots that came in today, uh, either by mail or at the drop-off locations in the polling places and the general registrar's office. So typically, you'll see that as the last thing reported. Danielle Cheslow, WMU. Hi, thanks. Do you know how this year's turnout compares to four years ago? Uh, the question was on turnout, and uh, the numbers are still coming in, I, and, and will continue to come in through Friday at noon. Um, so, uh, and, and like, like we mentioned earlier, past that. So uh, it's hard to say. It's, it's early to say. Anything that is out there at the moment would be anecdotal. Okay, we're going to move on. Let's zero in on one of the big battleground states in the race for president. We're talking about Florida. Back in 2016, president Trump, he created a lot of space between his campaign and Hillary Clinton there in the Sunshine State. But this time around, it's still considered a toss up. Campaign operatives on both sides say Democrat Joe Biden probably has an edge in early voting, even though we're seeing something a bit different right now. So President Trump, he's going to still have to make up a lot of ground with voters who turn out today on Election Day. That appears to be happening. Yeah, polls closed in the panhandle of Florida at 8 this evening. Polls in the rest of the state closed at 7. Reporter Ken Amaro joins us live from Jacksonville. Ken, what are you seeing down there? Trump is ahead. Uh, does it look like uh, Biden can overtake him, or is this pretty much the die has been cast? Well, you know, Bruce, I see a lot of pink on the Electoral College map, to be exact, because of the Panhandle, which is very red community, and they closed, as you said a second ago, at 8 o'clock Eastern, and now those votes are coming in, and they're holding steady for Mr. Trump, if you will. Here in Duval County, Jacksonville, which was red in 2016, it turned blue, and the hope was that this would have a trickle effect down to the I-4 corridor, where that is a, a very mixed Latino community of Puerto Ricans and Cubans and, and Mexicans and, and even Venezuelans. And so uh, the, compared to 2016, the thought was that that would be shored up 
uh, and become blue, and we don't know what the numbers are there as yet. We're still waiting on all the numbers to come in. But right now, this area that I'm standing in, it turned blue. It's the first time it's happened for a presidential candidate since 1976, uh, and that was Jimmy Carter. Uh, Trump won it in 2016, but he lost it uh, to Joe Biden. We know how important this state is. We've seen uh, uh, Mr. Biden had his surrogates here, uh, Kamala Harris, as well as uh, former President Barack Obama, and a number of others had made frequent trips here, but perhaps not as many as uh, Mr. Trump. He's been here several times in the Sunshine State trying to secure his win because he knows just how valuable those 29 electoral votes are. Thank Ken, you. thanks a lot for that. And Donald Trump, we should point out, is now an official resident of Florida also. Ken, thanks a lot. Yes, he is. And right now we want to go to our political analyst, Dr. David Carroll. Once again, Dr. Carroll, this whole race could hang on Florida. Are you surprised at all by some of the results we're seeing right now? Well, obviously, uh, the results in the Dade County, uh, Miami metropolitan area are better for President Trump than uh, many people thought. Um, and that could swing the state. Uh, but important to say, the big picture, uh, Florida is an important state, but uh, there are many scenarios in which uh, Vice President Biden wins without Florida. And that's not true for President Trump. He needs to win it. Uh, and it looks like he's it looks like he is. So that's definitely a big plus for him if that uh, if that's borne out. Um, but uh, we have a lot, you know, it's so we have a lot of other states. To see. So, so if we're looking at Florida. You say that we're looking at the results there. If President Trump gets Florida, what's the next state we should focus on from there? If you're well, I think, campaign. Well, they can't do anything at this point. But um, I think North Carolina uh, if we're looking at states on the East Coast uh, where he's hoping to make inroads, um, that's a state that, that has been in question uh, and that President Obama carried, but Secretary Clinton could not. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's another one. Um, and um, the, the states in the Midwest that were pivotal last time um, are going to, which is going to take us longer. It's going to take longer to, to, to know what happened in those states. They're slower to count their votes than Florida is. Yeah, and Dr. Carroll, what I find interesting about this race as well is we don't have the third party candidate taking away a lot of votes from, from either of these men. No, uh, that's right. Uh, last time, uh, both candidates had uh, historically low favorable ratings, uh, Secretary Clinton and uh, now President Trump. And uh, so there was a, a, a higher than usual third party vote. This time that hasn't happened. Uh, and um, there were, I think, some people who were not particularly happy with Secretary Clinton, but thought that uh, President that, that Donald Trump would never win. Uh, and some of those people this time voted uh, for Biden. Um, and uh, polls had shown that some of the people who voted for libertarian candidate also are switching to Biden. But we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see some good national polling on that later on. Um, and I don't know that that's the story in Florida, though. It seems like that's that's not really it seems like the story in Florida is much more what happened um, in the Miami area than the change in the third party vote. Yeah, and Dr. Carroll, finally, if, if you're at home watching, you're looking at all these different scenarios play out. Uh, what should we be looking at at this point? Well, um, if Florida is no longer on the table, as I said, uh, there are other states where we might really know where things stand tonight. That's probably not going to be tr might not be true for Pennsylvania or Michigan, uh, but uh, uh, it might be the case for Arizona. It might be the case for North Carolina. Those are very important states that are in play um, that that um, we might we might get a good sense by later this evening. All right, Dr. Carroll, we'll be checking in with you throughout the night, and we are glad you're with us for this expanded digital coverage as America decides. Right now, we're going to take a brief pause to get ready for a five-minute news cut-in on television. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back.
update on election night here in the D.C., Maryland and Virginia area. Good evening, I'm Leslie Foster and here's a look at some of the local races we are watching for you tonight. In Virginia, Democrat Mark Warner has been reelected for another six year term to the U.S. Senate. Republican Robert Whitman wins reelection in Virginia's first congressional district. Republican Ben Klein wins reelection in Virginia's sixth congressional district and Democrat Don Beyer wins reelection in Virginia's eighth congressional district. In the West Virginia Senate race, Republican Shelley Moore Capito has been declared the winner and Republican Jim Justice has been reelected West Virginia governor. In the presidential races, former Vice President Joe Biden has won DC, Maryland and Virginia. President Trump has taken West Virginia. Our Adam Longo is watching all of it, looking at these results as they come in. So Leslie, one thing to point out to you there is that you just showed uh, Mark Warner, the incumbent senator for Virginia, the Democrat winning the race, yet he was appearing to be behind in the vote total. A key thing that I've been able to learn about a lot of the results that are coming in and populating our Virginia map right now is a lot of the early voting results and ballots cast are not being reflected to this point in the numbers that we're seeing. That's why you're seeing, look, Joe Biden has been called the winner in Virginia by the Associated Press despite the fact that it appears President Trump has more votes than him at this point. When those numbers start getting reported, we're going to see things start to flip. I want to point out some things about our local counties here and how their votes are coming in so far. For, for look at Fairfax, for instance, right now with 78% of precincts reporting uh, Joe Biden coming in at 52% of the vote, whereby in 2016 in Fairfax County, uh, Hillary Clinton had 64.4%. 64.4% uh, of the vote. Um, I can also show you as we go through and look at some of the other counties in Northern Virginia, right? So we've got Arlington up here. How is that shaking out? I'm also just now getting results from DC and some of the wards in DC are starting to populate. So in Ward 3, 10% of precincts reporting. We know that Joe Biden has already been declared the winner by the Associated Press in the district. And these numbers mirror the numbers that we saw in 2016 with Hillary Clinton winning anywhere from 86 to 95 percent of the votes in some of the wards across D.C. All right. In Maryland, long lines led to many voters casting their ballots after the polls closed at 8 o'clock. Our Jess Arnold was at Tuscarora High School in Frederick. The final voters are inside here at Tuscarora High School in Frederick County waiting in line to vote. It'll probably be less than 20 minutes until everyone is through the line. Let me give you a look at the end of the line here. When the polls closed at eight, poll workers said there were only about 79 people left in line. Now this, after just an hour or so before, there was a 75 minute wait to get inside. Worth mentioning in Maryland State Department of Election data that was released earlier today, it said about 28% of people in Frederick County had taken advantage of early voting, not including provisional ballots and mail-in ballots. But as you can see, that line has shortened just in the time that we were talking. These are the last folks that will be voting here in Frederick County. In Frederick, Jess Arnold, WUSA 9. All right, CBS just called South Dakota for President Trump, and we will be back in another uh, half hour for you for an update. We'll send you back to CBS News coverage right now. Our local coverage, though, continues online at WUSA9.com and the WUSA9 app.
Welcome back. It's all about the numbers tonight and the results are coming in. Yeah, we know you want to see where the numbers stand right now. So let's get on over to Adam at Vic Board with some of the races that have been called and some that are still at play. Yeah. Right, so we're still trying to chart each candidate's path to a potential victory. Of course, victory being 270 electoral votes. We've been talking a lot about Florida tonight with our analysts. So let's go into the state of Florida and see how the results are coming back so far. 93% of the vote is in in Florida at this point. And as you can see, the disparity in difference between the two candidates votes right now about 300,000 separating them. So it's all about where are these outstanding votes that 7% where is that can that 7% make up enough votes for former Vice President Joe Biden to be able to overtake President Trump if not then we're going to have to go ahead and lean towards the Associated Press calling um, Florida for uh, President Trump. So if that were to happen, what's the electoral math work out then? So winning Florida is key for President Trump to be able to keep his hopes alive for the presidency. A number of other states he's going to have to win in addition to Florida for his path to 270. If President Trump wins Florida, Former Vice President Biden still has a number of opportunities to be able to get to 270. A couple of the states that he's going to want. Look, North Carolina here has just now turned purple as we've been talking. 54% of precincts reporting uh, Joe Biden with the lead of about 90,000 votes as it shakes out right now. So we're going to be watching North Carolina so closely as we move throughout the night. In addition, Ohio is another state that's very close right now. You can see the candidates separated by about 85,000 votes, but again, that's only with 32% uh, of the precincts reporting. One other state that we'll be watching closely, Wisconsin and Michigan. Only 10% coming back right now. Both candidates stampeding, barnstorming through both of these states, trying to get those votes that President Trump won uh, in Michigan and Wisconsin in, uh, in 2016. So as we come back out to the national map, I also want to show you the Senate map and how that's shaking out right now. You see these Senate seats that are color coded and circled right here. So in North Carolina, Cal Cunningham right now has a 48% uh, of the vote leading with 56%. So he is the Democrat trying to unseat Tom Tillis, who is the incumbent. Democrats need to flip three seats if they want the majority and if Joe Biden is elected four seats in order to get the majority in the Senate if President Trump wins. We do not expect that uh, the Senate majority will be decided tonight because of two key races, both of which in Georgia. There's a special election there. The incumbent who was appointed by the governor, Kelly Leffler, right now, 29% of the vote to the Democrat, Raphael Warnock. There's another Republican in this race as well. But in Georgia, the rules are different than in other places. In Georgia, for either that race or for the other Senate race that's going on, any candidate has to get to 50% plus one or else that's going to go to a runoff. So if I go back to this one, we would suspect that this race and the Senate majority will not be decided until this runoff happens in January. Other close Senate races that we've been watching include South Carolina, which doesn't appear to be that close anymore. But again, that's just with 41% of the vote reporting right now. Senator Lindsey Graham leading by about 11 percentage points uh, over Jamie Harrison, uh, the uh, challenger there. In Texas, uh, John Cornyn, who is the majority whip in the Senate, he is leading his challenger. Uh, MJ Hagar uh, by a pretty wide margin right now, about 300,000 votes, but again, still plenty more votes to be counted. And one more seat that I'm going to point out to you here. This is what was expected by pollsters. Doug Jones, the Democratic senator in Alabama right now, trailing badly to Tommy Tuberville, the former Auburn coach, again, with just 22 percent of precincts reporting. But Alabama, a deeply red state, one that we certainly expect to flip. But then on the other side, once we see votes start to come in in Arizona, that's a spot where Martha McSally, appointed by Governor Doug Ducey two years ago after after being defeated by Kirsten Sinema in that race, uh, is likely to lose this race, according to polling, to astronaut Mark Kelly, the husband of former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. Lorenzo? All right, thanks, Adam. And we want to turn our attention now to one of the congressional races in Virginia, the 10th District, which includes Clark, Frederick, and Loudoun Counties and parts of Fairfax and Prince William. Now, Jennifer Wexton, she snagged it for, for Democrats two years ago, but she's now trying to fend off Republican challenger Elise, Alicia Andrews. Laura Geller is live with the Andrews election night watch party in Lansdowne right now. And how's the campaign feeling, Laura, with these results right now? It appears that Andrews is leading, but they haven't uh, tallied those early votes as of yet. Well, Lorenzo, we haven't heard from Alicia Andrews or seen her yet tonight, but we are told she is in the building and she's watching the results come in in another room. 
The mood here tonight started out pretty subdued, but as we've heard from more and more speakers, the enthusiasm from the crowd has grown. You can hear them behind me as they watch these results. And while the AP and others have called Virginia for Joe Biden, the folks here tell me they believe it is too early to make that call and they're remaining positive about their candidates. Take a listen to that enthusiasm. Law and order. Faith and freedom. Four more years. The group gathered here are spending the night chatting about the election and glued to the screen watching the results come in. The chairman of the 10th District Republican Committee tells me this event was set up as a place to thank GOP volunteers. He says they are excited about tonight. Now, I've covered a lot of elections in Virginia for more than a decade now, and this event is different than anything I've ever seen because of the pandemic safety measures in place. The tables are a bit further apart than usual. They're keeping track of how many people are coming in and out of the room, and they're handing out masks, and there's also hand sanitizer. Although I will say we have seen a lot of people here who are not wearing those masks, and that number has grown throughout the night. It's also different because as we've been reporting, there's a good chance we might not have an official winner of the presidential race before the end of the night. Here's what the chairman had to say about that. I would tell everybody to just hang in there, see what happens and see how it plays out. And um, I think that ultimately it's going to come out with the right decision for those that are here. I'm prejudiced about that, I'm sure. But uh, just be patient. Have you ever seen so much engagement? This year has been pretty amazing, and given the fact that um, we've had this pandemic, uh, it's, it's even more amazing because that has limited people's access to information. Now, we are told we he will hear from Alicia Andrews tonight, but it won't be until her race is called. So we are watching that closely and taking a listen to people here and feeling how they're feeling about this race. So we will, of course, be keeping you updated throughout the night. Guys, back to you. All right, Laura. So Virginia is not a battleground state, but there are several we are keeping our eyes on tonight, and North Carolina is one of them. The presidential election is not the only tight race. Democrats have a chance to flip another Senate seat. Cal Cunningham is challenging incumbent Tom Tillis. As for the race for the White House, First Lady Melania Trump and Dr. Jill Biden made a final push for support this week. And joining us now from Charlotte is Nate Marita Maribo. And uh, the latest numbers show Biden leading by a couple of points, but it is, of course, a razor thin margin. Leslie, it's, it's narrowed even more since you last hit refresh on your computer screen. We're talking about now one percentage point separating Joe Biden from President Donald Trump. Joe Biden right now having a slight one percentage point edge. And this comes after absentee voting was such a huge story here in North Carolina, as well as early voting. And he took an early lead today because of that, as expected. And the question would be, on election day, how many voters would come out and how many voters would support the president? And would there be enough to narrow that gap? And what we're seeing right now with uh, about two thirds of the votes now tallied here in North Carolina is that that is incredibly narrow right now. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. We're in Charlotte here in Mecklenburg County, which is one of the largest counties in the state. And overwhelmingly, this county right now is going to Joe Biden with 67 percent of the vote. We should mention right now, too, that President Trump has come to our area, specifically in the state of North Carolina, multiple times in just the last few weeks. And really, the RNC was here in Charlotte. Remember that size down RNC. And every time he comes here, uh, particularly when he holds a rally, he, number one, draws a huge crowd. But number two, draws on something that, that is clear he thinks will be a big decider for people here in North Carolina. And that is our Democratic governor's decision to slowly shut down the state and reopen the state due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and he has said time after time again, specifically in North Carolina, that after election day, everything's gonna be open, specifically here in North Carolina, saying that he feels like the state has been shut down for too long, even though several facets of business have been open for a long time now and reopened. And of course, his wife was in town, Melania, yesterday. Uh, Dr. Jill Biden also came to North Carolina. Joe Biden, though, really we haven't seen nearly as much 
uh, in October, he came through quite a few times. I also want to mention this Senate race because that Senate race is critical and it's even less than a percentage point. And I'm going to sneak peek here on my little uh, desk. Right now, Kel Cunningham, 48.25% of the vote to Senator Tom Tillis is 47.55%. You cannot watch anything on television in North Carolina without seeing a Tom Tillis, a Cal Cunningham, a Donald Trump, and a Joe Biden commercial in that span of that commercial break. You know, there was a lot of concern uh, among Democrats of Cal Cunningham's sexting scandal and what impact that would have. And I think it's, it's really still too early right now. It's so tight, it really could come down to the final votes uh, as they start to come in. But thus far, he seems to have still kind of held on to the edge against the incumbent, Tom Tillis, who many will align with the president, uh, but also some have tried to, to argue is a Republican in name only. So it's certainly uh, shaping up to be tight tonight in here in North Carolina. Thankfully, a state that has been able to count its absentee ballots and early votes up until this point. Of course, the absentee uh, ballots that are postmarked today can continue to trickle in. Uh, really up until April, uh, April, geez, November 12th. So, we, you know, if it's really tight, that could be a factor. But uh, the low turnout today seems to suggest that those who have voted uh, have voted today, and maybe there may be some more absentee ballots coming in at some point. But 15 electoral votes at stake right here in North Carolina. North Carolina is apparently a, a real surprise for a lot of folks in the fact that it could be, you know, one of the decisive states. I do wonder, Nate, I know that there were some polls that that had to stay open a little late because there were some issues and that that some of the polling results could be a little late coming in. Um, are you seeing any impact and, and what do you know about that at this point? Yeah, so there were a handful of uh, polling locations across the state, including one in our area that had a bit of a technical issue, number one, which resulted in the poll staying open for about 30 to 40 minutes longer than normal. And that, that happened in a couple other uh, counties as well. One had a human error issue, but there were some technical glitches. And in the end, the results started coming in at 8.15. You know, we had hoped at 7.30 to start having the early vote and the absentee vote tabulated so we can get an early look at, at you know, how people voted. But 815 is when that started to come in. But I have to tell you, across the state of North Carolina, there really have been minimal election day problems. Here in Charlotte earlier today, a, a man did make a stir. Uh, he showed up to a voting site. He voted. He was uh, legally carrying a gun. Uh, police said he potentially intimidated voters at that polling site and was asked to leave and banned from that site and he left and police say he later came back so he was charged with trespassing. That's the one thing that seems unusual here in North Carolina that happened today. The rest of the delays that delayed, you know, the results coming in tonight, that happens in every election. Some, some kind of variation of that is going to happen, uh, but thus far, particularly in Mecklenburg County, really things have been incredibly smooth tonight and, and you know, we're looking at a before midnight, all the votes here in Charlotte being totaled. The eyes of the nation are all beaming down on North Carolina. And Nate, I apologize for saying your, your last name incorrectly. It's Nate Morabito. I want to make sure I acknowledge you and give you some respect there. Thank you Nate so Morabito. much. Nate Morabito, yes. It's not a common name, so no ding for no, you No, I, un I understand what it's like when people mispronounce your name. So uh, thanks for your hard work out there, and thanks for uh, some context tonight. All right. We want to get now to our political analyst, Dr. David Carroll with the University of Maryland. And uh, Dr. Carroll here, another race call tonight. The AP is calling Colorado for Biden. Back in 2016, we know this was considered a battleground state, but this time around, not so much. Are you, are you surprised at all by this call? No, that's another state, Lorenzo, a really like Virginia that has been moving from one party to the other. There's so much migration into the Denver area, and that's helping uh, Democrats in that state. Uh, and so um, not a big surprise. Uh, the, the Republicans really weren't, uh, really didn't hold out much hope for Colorado this year. Yeah, speaking of moving from one party to the other, let's focus in on Texas here, if you will. I feel like we haven't given this enough attention. I, I can't believe we're talking about Texas being a toss-up at this point. We know that President Trump, he's campaigned there just a little bit this election cycle, but not too much. Do you think he's confident enough about winning Texas? Well, I, I think that um, it's a very big country, you know, and uh, I think that um, 
the Democrats have made gained ground in Texas in 2018. Beto O'Rourke Senate race, he came closer than many expected, but they weren't quite there yet. Uh, I know um, Kamala Harris went to Texas. I think Vice President Biden didn't go, if I'm correct. He didn't go either, uh, although he spent some money there. So it's definitely a state that is in play in a way that it, it hasn't been uh, for many years. Uh, and uh, if Obviously, it's such an enormous state. Uh, if if Vice President Biden could take Texas, uh, that also, I think, would be decisive. Um, but, we, you know, we, we certainly can't say that yet. Dr. Carol, Adam Longo, fellow Terp here. I wonder, you just mentioned Colorado uh, a moment ago, and I wonder, with uh, Joe Biden being called the winner there in Colorado, how do we expect things to go down ballot there? I mean, we know that uh, the incumbent Senator Cory Gardner is facing stiff competition from former Governor John Hickenlooper. The Democrats need to just flip three seats and win the presidency to take the majority four seats if President Trump wins. Anything that you're seeing suggest this far uh, into the night that the Senate uh, might flip down the road? Well, it's a possibility, but if I can, Adam, just make a slight amendment to mm -hmm. uh, the way you described it. The Democrats need to flip three seats, and then the Vice President Kamala Harris, if, if Biden wins, could break the tie. But right. they are losing the seat in Alabama. So, uh, uh, Doug Jones. Uh, so they actually have to pick up four seats in other states for a net gain of three if Biden wins. And Colorado would be one of those states, and all indications are that it is going to be one of those states. And then the other likely candidates would be Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, where Martha McSally's running for a full, uh, as a Republican, and Mark Kelly, the Democrat, and then in North Carolina, which we were just hearing about, and then up in Maine, the Susan right. Collins and Sarah Gideon. So, no, I think it is possible, but if... if uh, Democrats really need uh, 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 Mr. Cunningham in North Carolina is very important for their hopes of, of being able to flip the Senate. Uh, and if, uh, you know, there hasn't been uh, a Democratic president who didn't start out with both houses of Congress since I think the 19th century. So that would be very challenging for Vice President Biden, even if he succeeds, um, you know, in winning the 270 electoral votes in terms of governing, it would be uh, very challenging if he'd start out a minority in the Senate. Another one of those close uh, Senate races that we're watching is uh, Gary Peters in Michigan uh, with John James, the uh, businessman and veteran there. And, of course, the two elections in Georgia that we'll be uh, keeping a close eye on. Of course, the, uh, the special election that we certainly expect to go to a runoff because we don't expect uh, the incumbent Kelly Leffler or any of the other candidates to get to 50 percent. And then I'm going to take you to the other Georgia Senate seat, which is up for a full term here. This is David Perdue with 34 percent of the precincts reporting, 34 uh, percent of the vote reporting, has a lead of about 57 uh, percent over investment investigative journalist uh, John Ossoff here. So uh, if we want to come back and actually look at the national map, I can highlight a, a few things there uh, real quick. Uh, Dr. Carroll, as we push west, let's get in another question with you here. Uh, Arizona and Nevada seem to be the two states really the most in question as we push towards the west. We know, we very strongly suspect Oregon, Washington, California going to go to Joe Biden. Uh, Idaho already right. called, uh, I believe, for, for uh, President Trump. We would expect Utah to go to that way as well. What are you seeing about Nevada and Arizona that could tell you how this race might go? Well, I haven't seen anything in the last uh, few moments. But um, one thing I'd say is that we have to watch is, uh, is the situation in Florida really a special you case about the Cuban American community in Miami or the broader weakness among Latino voters for uh, Vice President Biden. There's some indications from Texas in Mexican American areas that uh, he's not doing as well as Secretary Clinton. And if that is true, uh, it could complicate things for him in Arizona and uh, in Nevada. Um, but it's early to say, but that's one of the things that um, I think they have to be concerned about. Carol, if we can uh, pull up the big map over there, Adam, looking at this map here, I'm assuming you can see it out there. If you're the Biden campaign, what are you worried about right now? If you're the Trump campaign, what are you worried about? Well, I mean, the simplest path to victory for Vice President Biden is just flipping those three states in the Great Lakes in the Midwest that uh, he that Hillary Clinton unexpectedly lost last time, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. And for 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 the Democrats, the encouraging sign is that uh, Vice President Biden seems to be doing pretty well in Ohio. And it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to win Ohio, which would be an upset. But demographically, it's somewhat similar to these other states that surround it. And so that is encouraging 
uh, for Democrats. Um, but it would be uh, they would be resting a lot easier if they were doing better in these southern, southern and southwestern states. All right, Dr. Carroll, we'll be checking in with you throughout the evening. Thank you so much. And, you know, this uh, we're glad you're with us for this expanded digital coverage as America decides. Right now, we're going to take a brief pause for a news cut in. It's going to take about five minutes on TV. We'll meet you back here in a couple minutes. Don't go anywhere. This is a WUSA 9 update on election night here in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bruce Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Presidential election winners have now been declared in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. There are really no surprises right now. Let's take a look. First in D.C., former Vice President Joe Biden has been declared the winner. No surprise there. The former Vice President also won Maryland, and Biden has also defeated President Trump in Virginia. No surprises. Well, over in West Virginia, the president has been declared the winner. 
will be the former vice president. Our Adam Longo is at the big board to show us how our local states are playing in the Electoral College. Adam? Yeah, let me hammer that out for you real quick. I've got the state of Virginia up right here, and I'll take you county by county through some of our key counties in just a moment. But first, as you can see in the presidential race, uh, the electoral math as it's shaking out for the states that have been called definitively for either candidate so far. Joe Biden in the lead with 131 electoral votes to President Trump's 89. You can see our local states right in here as I zoom in a little bit closer. Virginia with its 13 electoral votes going uh, to Joe Biden. West Virginia with five votes going to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, D.C. and Maryland having been called for Joe Biden at this point in the night. So as we go into Virginia, what I'm going to show you here is county by county the breakdown. So for instance, Loudoun County, they say 100 percent, bam, they're all done. So I'm going to show you here is how it broke out in 2016 and I'm going to show you the difference. So Hillary Clinton in Loudoun County had 55.1 of the vote in 2016 to President Trump's 38.2. Uh, so you can see how Joe Biden increased the Democratic margin there while there wasn't much of a difference in between uh, the margin and the Republican side. As I clear that out and I can back out and show you some of the other counties in our area. Fairfax, for instance, 53% to uh, uh, Joe Biden, the former vice president. And in Fairfax, it's 64.4% actually uh, uh, to Hillary Clinton in 2016 with 5% of the vote uh, still outstanding. As we take a look at some of the other counties down here, as we'll be doing throughout the night, Stafford County was another county that was interesting to us that we'll be taking a close look at when we have a more complete picture of the numbers. Adam, thanks a lot. Our Nathan Baca joins us live now from the White House where he's been watching the comings and goings from President Trump's election night gathering. Nathan. Well, that's right, Bruce. CBS News reporting that 400 invited guests coming here to the White House. They all came in through this gate, many of them coming in through this gate on 15th and Pennsylvania. The Secret Service uniform police was here. Now that the invited guests are inside, the Secret Service have also moved inside. You can see the gate that they opened up and that uh, the security guards went in through there. Now, again, 400 invited guests. We saw some of them come on in. We saw them saying that they had wristbands that they had to um, that they had to wear. Also saying that uh, many of them did actually go first to Trump Hotel where the party was originally going through. I'm going to have uh, our photojournalist Beck and I are um, coming through there so you could just get a context. That is the White House right there. The uh, north uh, side of it. Uh, once you see it in focus, you'll see that that is where the party is at right now. Uh, again, the party was originally supposed to be held at the Trump uh, Hotel just up Pennsylvania Avenue, but um, D.C. government was saying that was going to be a problem when it came to the COVID restrictions on gathering all, all those people in. But again, now 400 people, we are told, in the East Room of the White House. Reporting live from the Southeast Gate of the White House, Nathan Baca, WUSA 9. My question is, when does the party start and when does it end? We're going to be back with another local update for you in a half hour. Let's we'll send it back to CBS News now. Our local coverage continues now online.
Well, as predicted, people are gathering to react to the night's election results. Not too many big parties indoors because of the pandemic, of course, but there, these, there are a number of different groups gathering for different reasons. Right now, you're looking live at Black Lives Matter Plaza, which is right near the White House. You see in the distance there. In the last few minutes, we've seen some demonstrators there yelling at police. We're not sure exactly what started that back and forth, but we're going to try and get you a live report from that plaza in just a minute. But it's largely been peaceful there. But we know at this hour, you want to see results and where the race stands right now, especially those critical races. We're trying to get a better picture of the, the path to victory for these candidates. Our Adam Long goes to the big board, breaking it all down for us right now. Hey, Adam. Hey, so uh, no big surprises to this point yet. The map is filled in like we suspected and like pollsters suspected leading up to this point. It would be just a few minutes ago. The Associated Press called the state of Colorado for President Trump. Uh, that was something that was widely expected. Uh, both candidates uh, practically conceding the state. I'm not sure if any uh, did any hardcore campaigning through there. Also interesting in Colorado, one of those Senate seats that Democrats needed to flip to inch closer to the majority the Associated Press has called that race. So uh, what we're going to be looking at there in Colorado is that has actually gone to the former governor, John Hickenlooper, uh, winning right now 55% of the vote. But again, this race called over the incumbent Republican, uh, Cory Gardner. Back to our big map here and some of the things that we are seeing and some of the things that we might expect as we move forward over the close of the night. So we just heard uh, Nora O'Donnell with CBS uh, say that Florida is leaning Trump, but they're not calling it red yet, right? Too close to call. A lot of uh, votes still need to be counted. This is showing us 98% of the vote tallied, but as you can see, the disparity in votes uh, between the two candidates right here is ending up looking shortly uh, just just under 400,000 votes right now uh, between uh, President Trump and former Vice President Biden uh, in Florida. As we look at some of the other states, what's really fascinating here is to look at the state of Texas. This has actually uh, been uh, Vice President Biden has been in the lead tonight, and now President Trump is starting to overtake him. I mean, it would be a colossal shift in political uh, movement. Uh, the earth would shake under Texas uh, were Joe Biden uh, to win that state right now, uh, separated by about 215,000 votes. The states that we are going to watch so closely tonight and the states that we actually might get numbers for but might not are North Carolina, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. I want to focus on those for a second. Let's talk about North Carolina first. North Carolina was able to start counting its mail-in ballots early. We suspect, unless it's razor close, that we might actually have answers to what's going on in North Carolina tonight and who might walk away with this huge prize of 15 electoral votes. As you can see right now, with just 77% uh, of the votes reporting, uh, President Trump uh, trailing uh, Joe Biden by about 9,000 votes in the state. Still a lot more votes uh, that need to be counted there uh, in North Carolina. In Ohio right now, let's take a look at that because the vote uh, totals 58% right now. Uh, President Trump leading in Ohio, but uh, by a margin of only about uh, one, uh, 130,000 votes. I'm doing this math quick in my head, so it might be just completely off. I'm in journalism for a reason because the math uh, just didn't do it for me in school. All right, uh, uh, other states, the great late states. All right, Pennsylvania is not going to be called tonight. Unless it was a blowout for either candidate, which we didn't expect it would be, both candidates campaigning and putting a lot of energy into this state, Pennsylvania didn't start counting its mail-in ballots until yesterday, right? And they're still doing it. It's going to take a while. So if any candidate had their hat hung on winning Pennsylvania to carry them to the presidency, then they're not going to be able to declare that victory tonight, uh, more than likely. And you can see just how close it is right now, separated by just about 11,000 votes, with only 26% of the votes uh, coming in. Uh, Michigan is a state that was not allowed to start counting its mail-in ballots until today. So we don't expect to have a full picture of Michigan. Of course, if these numbers right here uh, were to hold, uh, as this number, 25% of the vote went up, we would see that President Trump would likely be able to declare victory uh, in Michigan because, as you can see right here, a spread of about 200,008, uh, 208,000 votes uh, separating uh, the two candidates uh, right there. So as I take you back to the national map, I also want to point out to you uh, Arizona, which we don't have results for yet. 
This could easily go Democratic. That's where the polls are saying, but this is a state that's too close to call. Uh, also, Nevada is another state as well. As polls close along the West Coast, we can certainly expect, according to the polls, this would not be a stretch to assume that California, Oregon, and Washington would go to uh, the former vice president, leading him to uh, have a huge lead in the electoral math. But if we were to actually hand over Texas to President Trump, you would see how the, his electoral math would start to climb. So, All right. Thank you, Adam. Right now, we want to get over to Black Lives Matter Plaza, where our Eric Flack is right now. We know this has been the center of expression for a lot of people over the last couple of months, so it's only fitting that a lot of demonstrators are out there tonight uh, expressing themselves once more, not just at the ballot box. And Eric, we mentioned a minute ago that uh, you saw some people yelling at police officers down there. What's the deal with that? Yeah, so it was our first uh, kind of witnessing of any unrest. It, it happened uh, right over my shoulder here at the corner of 16th and I, right in the middle of Black Lives Matter Plaza. Now, we had seen kind of a roving group of, of what appeared to be young people wearing those uh, uh, light up masks that are made famous uh, in the Purge movies. If you've seen those, you know what I'm talking about. But they were all dressed in kind of matching masks. One of them was carrying a bat. They had kind of been ominously walking through the crowd for for much of the night. Uh, it was unclear exactly what, what their purse was. Uh, they certainly told a couple of people to stop taking pictures of them. I turned around and what you're seeing is the aftermath when police caught at least one of the people in that group that, that they were chasing. Uh, I saw him sprinting as fast as he could, and you kind of hear the screams and you turn around. Uh, that guy in the mask actually lost his footing, went down, hit a curb, just kind of like his body slammed into the curb. That gave police enough time to catch up to him and surround him. At that point, that's when everybody kind of gathers around, pulls out their cell phones. Uh, there's a lot of anti-police uh, uh, sentiment in, at times like those, despite the fact nobody really, including myself, saw what exactly precipitated uh, police uh, chasing this guy. Uh, there was uh, a bunch of other crews, uh, police uh, officers and, and reinforcements that were called in. Eventually they did, police did uh, disperse some sort of gas. Uh, I'm not saying it was pepper spray. I'm not saying it was any sort of tear gas, but it was some sort of gas that kind of dispersed the crowd. And um, everything has calmed down since then. We do believe that one person was taken into custody. Uh, we do not know exactly what they were being uh, charged uh, with um, or what, again, precipitated that chase. Uh, but we do know that there was um, that moment of unrest. Uh, one person uh, chased by D.C. police, that person part of a roving group wearing these uh, purge masks, one of them carrying that baseball bat. Something happened up this block uh, between them and police that precipitated this. Uh, there was uh, those, those uh, tense moments. Those seem to have um, uh, subsided uh, for now, Zoe, but we'll keep an eye on it for sure. Yeah, and Eric, really quickly, what are the people there, what's the purpose of this tonight? What are they doing? I see a lot of people just standing around, walking around, but uh, there doesn't appear to be a big message, not a lot of chanting like we've seen in the past. So uh, what's the purpose of this? You know, I think that depends on on who who you're talking to down here, Zoe, right? I mean, I think there are certainly people down uh, by Lafayette Square Park who uh, are um, waving their flags. Uh, there are some chants. Uh, this is uh, obviously a very, a very, very anti-President Trump sort of crowd. Uh, some are now watching election returns over my shoulder. Um, I, I did ask one guy who was Democratic, uh, uh, rooting for a, a, a Biden win, you know, as this continues to get tighter and as President Trump saves more and more viable in this race, do you go home and really, you know, get somewhere where you can really focus on these returns and maybe even listen because there's no audio down here? His response, no, because the more that President Trump stays in this race, I think the more he, he's telling me the more things are going to get tense in here. He had a camera around his neck. So there are a lot of people here 
as evidenced by what happened over uh, my shoulder, that are basically just here to witness unrest. There are probably some people here that are here to cause unrest. And, and, and so that's kind of the, the balancing act, so. Yeah, hopefully it will be a quiet night down there in the long run. Eric, thank you so much. And we want to continue our election coverage now with another check on a key battleground state. Most polls show Vice President Biden with a comfortable lead of more than 10% in Colorado. The AP is calling Colorado for the former vice president, but this election is about more than just the White House. Colorado is one of 15 states with key Senate races. Republican incumbent Senator Cory Gardner, he's trying to fend off his Democratic challenger, former Governor John Hickenlooper, and the polls suggest that seat could flip blue tonight. Noel Brennan joins us live now from the Denver election office with much more on this shift we're seeing right now. Hey, Noel. All right. It looks like we are not getting his audio there, but uh, you know, we've been talking about this with our Adam Longo for most of the night, uh, talking about this shift we're seeing in Colorado right now. Uh, Adam, where does it stand? Colorado has been declared, as you mentioned, for uh, Vice President Biden. And then the Senate seat there uh, in Colorado as well right has here. been called by the Associated Press as well. So that has flipped um, the uh, governor the there, uh, former governor, John Hickenlooper, 55% uh, of the vote. But he has been called over the incumbent senator, uh, Republican uh, Cory Gardner. As we look at this Senate map, this is key too, right? Because Democrats are in the minority in the Senate. And there is a path, several of them, that could carry them to the majority or at least a tie in the Senate. So here's what would have to play out. If three seats in the Senate flip from Republican hands to Democratic hands and Joe Biden wins the presidency, then Kamala Harris, as the vice president, presides over the Senate as the president of the Senate would be able to be a tiebreaker if President Trump were to win re-election, the Democrats would have to flip four seats. So the ones that we'll be keeping a close eye on tonight are the seats in North Carolina. Tom Tillis, the incumbent, has a tough uh, challenger in uh, Cal Cunningham, who is the Democrat. 80% of the precincts uh, reporting right there. Uh, Alabama is one that has flipped. The Democrat, Doug Jones, has lost that race to former Auburn coach uh, Tommy Tuberville. More on the Senate as we push through the evening, so. All right, thanks, Adam. And we want to try it one more time to get back to Noel Brennan at the Denver election office with uh, more on the shift we're seeing in Colorado. You got me this time, Noel? I hope so. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear so you. When it we're comes good to go. To the pres Great. So when it comes to the presidential race in, in Colorado, Colorado has shown that it is not a purple state. It is not a swing state. It has voted blue now the past four presidential elections going big tonight for Joe Biden, along with uh, former governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, who defeated the incumbent, Senator Cory Gardner, in the Senate race here. So voter turnout in Colorado, it has been huge. We have seen that in early voting and those numbers coming in today. We surpassed numbers from 2016 this morning. And we know that as of seven tonight, the latest update from the Secretary of State's office, more than 3.1 million ballots had been returned in Colorado. 80% turnout about for active registered voters in the state. By comparison, in 2016, voter turnout was about 74% in Colorado. Here in Denver, we have been watching election judges here at Denver Elections. They are currently taking a break, but not too long ago, this space was just filled with people that were at these tables out here. They were taking part in grabbing all of these ballots and flattening them out before they actually go into a room where they're counted. When it comes to all of these election judges in Denver and Colorado, in Denver, they're seeing record number of applicants this year. They had about 1,100 um, election judges in the city alone this year and more than 8,000 applicants. So a huge turnout for voters and a huge turnout for election workers in this election, guys. All right, Noel Brennan there in Denver. Thank you so much. Now back here at home, we're looking at what happens to your ballot after you drop it off in one of those ballot drop boxes. And a lot of you have been talking about transparency when it comes to the process of counting your ballot. So our Adi Ande Till takes us behind the scenes at polling places in D.C. Now that the polls are closed, it's up to D.C. Board of Elections to go across the 55 different drop box locations to pick up those last minute mail in ballots. Once they're picked up, you probably want to know how long it's going to take to get them counted. Well, I came right here to the D.C. Board of Elections warehouse in the Northeast to not only find out, but to show you firsthand. Check it out. 
<laughs> Once your ballot arrives at the DC BOE warehouse, it will make eight more stops over the course of two to three days before it's officially counted. The first stop that your ballot is going to make is right here. The envelope, whether it was through USPS or a drop box, is going to come right here to have the flap removed. Once your signature is exposed, then it's off to the sorting machine where it will be separated by ward. Once an envelope comes off of the sorter, it's processed into three different categories, a verified signature, a signature that doesn't match, or an envelope that doesn't have a signature. All signatures are verified by three different people. If they can't verify the signature against their records, then the BOE will send and email you a letter so that you can clear it up. You have 10 days to do that. Then it's back to the sorting machine. This time the envelopes with verified signatures make their way to the floor for opening. Once opened, ballots are separated and sorted into precinct order. Since mail-in ballots started being processed here on October 5th, approximately 280,000 ballots have come into this warehouse. About 100,000 of those still need to be counted, but that doesn't account for the ballots that are being cast today across the district and the ones that will come into this center at 8 p.m. when the polls close. The final step of the process is the scanner. All ballots with verified signatures are scanned onto a USB, then driven down to the DC BOE headquarters where they will be officially tallied. If it's dropped off at 759, it absolutely positively will be counted. No questions asked. Any ballots that are picked up today will come right here to join the thousands of others that still need to be processed. And if history is an example, that'll take about two to three days until your ballot gets counted. But what I can tell you is that the over 60 ballot processors here are working as hard as they possibly can to get your vote counted. From Northeast, I'm Marianne Daytil, WUSA 9. All right, so the ballots are in and now the polls have been closed for hours in a lot of places right now and we are getting some of those results and let's go back to Adam Longo over there at the big board uh, to see how this is all playing out right now and uh, what's expected for the rest of the night, Adam. Yeah, I want to talk about expectations as it pertains to the electoral math. First of all, just so you have the broad picture here of all the votes that have been reported so far in the states that you see color coded somehow and I'll explain that in just a second. So right now in the popular vote, at least you've got President Trump uh, leading by about a million and a half votes, but it's still plenty more votes to be counted. And then if you look at the electoral math right now, as the electoral uh, votes go to the candidates who have been declared in certain states, you can see uh, Joe Biden in the lead with uh, 131 electoral votes to uh, President Trump's 95. But what I want to talk about on this map is first all these colors that you see, right? It looks like this potpourri of color. Take this full at home so you guys can uh, see, uh, take this full, actually control room folks, so the folks at home can see this better. Um, so what you're seeing here, the deeper the color, the more uh, locked in that state is for the certain candidate, right? So North Dakota, South Dakota, President Trump has won those. The deep blues, New Mexico, Colorado, okay? Joe Biden has won those. Look at the light colors, okay? These are the states that are too close to call. These are the states CBS is calling Texas and Florida leaning Trump, but they're not quite there yet because those states are too close to call. Of course, North Carolina, a key battleground right now, 82% reporting. It looks like as far as votes go, uh, President Trump leading Joe Biden by about 25, 30,000 votes. Um, another state that we're looking at is, look, these are just early returns, but like we wouldn't expect Joe Biden to win Montana, but just on the early votes that have come in right now, he is actually leading in that state. And then another one that just sort of divides convention uh, at the moment would be uh, Nebraska as a swing state is unlikely, but Nebraska is an interesting case study, and here's why. So Nebraska, the congression, the second congressional district of, uh, that surrounds Omaha is right there. So Joe Biden could actually win that because Nebraska apportioned Portions its electoral votes based on popular vote and winners in each congressional district. So theoretically, Joe Biden could win one electoral vote in Nebraska while President Trump wins four. So. All right. Thank you, Adam. We are glad you were with us for this expanded digital coverage as America decides right now. We're going to wrap up here for just a minute to get ready for a half hour of coverage on television. Anchored by Leslie Foster and Bruce Johnson. I'm going to step out so they can step in. But if you're joining us on Facebook, you can head on over to our app or our website. I'm going to be talking with our political analyst, Dr. David Carroll, for more analysis about what we're seeing play out tonight. We'll be back in just a minute.
All right, this is a WUSA 9 update on election night here. And good evening, I'm Leslie Foster. So here's a look at some of the local races we're watching for you tonight. In the district, D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton has been reelected to another term in the U.S. Congress. In Virginia, Democrat Mark Warner has been reelected for another six-year term to the U.S. Senate. Republican Robert Whitman wins reelection in Virginia's first congressional district. Republican Ben Klein wins reelection in Virginia's sixth congressional district. And Democrat Donald Byer wins reelection in Virginia's eighth congressional district. Virginia's other congressional races have still yet to be called. In Maryland, Democrat Anthony Brown wins re-election in the state's fourth congressional district. Democrat Steny Hoyer wins re-election in Maryland's fifth congressional district. And Adam Longo is breaking down the rest of the results as they come in. Hey, Ed. Right, so we'll start with the big board and the massive electoral picture of the country at this point. You can see former Vice President Biden leading with the 131 electoral votes to President Trump's 95. But I want to focus in on some of the results that we're finally getting from Maryland. We know that Joe Biden has has been declared the winner here in Maryland, but I also have some county by county results to show you that are actually pretty fascinating, right? So for instance, I'm gonna look at Prince George's County with 74% uh, of the uh, uh, electorate being uh, reported right now. If we want to compare this to what happened in 2016, and what I think is interesting about this is how the vote split has widened. So 88 point one percent of this just updated um, in 2016. So you can see how Vice President Biden did better than Hillary Clinton did uh, in 2016 to President Trump had 8.4 percent. So pretty similar there. Also, I can take you over to uh, what was the other county that just popped up here? Sorry about that. Uh, Prince George's County and uh, Howard County as well. So in Howard County, 63.3% uh, was Hillary Clinton's number in 2016. You can see that Joe Biden has outpaced that by 10 percentage points so far. All right, Ed, thank you. Crowds down at Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House are continuing to watch results. You know, Black Lives Matter Plaza has been a real gathering point for people who support a change in the administration. And this election night is no different. Our Eric Flack is down there taking the temperature, listening to a whole lot down there. Uh, what's happening now, Eric? Leslie, I want to stress that this is a very uh, pro Joe Biden, uh, anti uh, President Trump crowd that has been largely peaceful throughout the night. But we did see our first signs of unrest. It happened uh, just over my shoulder here at the corner of 16th and I. There was a group of uh, roving uh, young people wearing uh, light up masks made famous by those purge movies. One of them was holding a bat. I witnessed that myself. They had kind of been roving through the um, the crowd when what you're seeing on the screen happened. One of those uh, people in the group was being chased by DC police. I do not know what precipitated that chase, chase, but witnesses told me that one of the officers said, get him. They pushed him down. They arrested him. One of two arrests from this incident here just a couple moments ago, Leslie. All righty, we'll be back here in a half hour with an expanded commercial free 11 p.m. news with the latest results and analysis. For now, we'll send you back to CBS News's election night coverage.
Action Night 2020 with uh, Dr. David Carroll, a, a professor at the University of Maryland, professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland. Right. Thanks for, for hanging out and chatting with us a bit more tonight. It's good to be here. All right, so we're, we're seeing a lot of these results coming in right now. And, you know, a lot of the focus has been on President Trump and Joe Biden, that race, but also the Senate race. We know Democrats are trying to take some of the seats, peel, peel that majority back away from Republicans. Not looking too promising right now, it, though. It's, it's, it's going to be very tight, and yeah. it's, it's looking increasingly difficult for Democrats to do that. If they don't win the North Carolina Senate seat, uh, where Senator Tillis is running against Cal Cunningham, it's going to be really hard for them to do that, uh, which would mean even if Vice President Biden is elected, um, he will be blocked. All, all of these policy initiatives he was campaigning on, almost all of them would be blocked, probably. Yeah, so we keep talking about the numbers that the, the Democrats need to take over the Senate. We're talking about roughly three or four seats. Yeah. Doesn't sound like a large number, but you're, you're talking about a lot of these Republican districts yeah. um, that are known to vote Republican. So it's a little tough for yeah. Democrats so, to take so those. One, one factor on this point you raised is uh, Democrats are losing a Senate seat tonight. They're losing the seat in Alabama that right. Doug Jones won three years ago. That's a very Republican state, and they, they won that because uh, the Republican candidate, Judge Roy Moore, was in a big scandal. Right. Uh, and only because of that. Uh, Doug Jones was able to win the special election in 2017, and they always sort of anticipated they wouldn't be able to hold that seat. Mm -hmm. So they have to win four seats in other states to net three. If Biden Harris are elected, then Harris, Vice President Harris breaks the tie and they have a majority. But they need to pick up four others, and if they can't get the North Carolina seat, it becomes really hard to see. Yeah, let's talk about the seat with Doug Jones just a bit more in Alabama, because I remember when he when he did win that seat, yeah. it was kind of like, oh, you know, this big deal, you know, in Alabama of all places. Yeah. Is there anything he could have done to, to hold on to this seat I at really all, or was it kind of inevitable? So. I don't think so. I okay. think he's well regarded personally, but you know, party of loyalties are very strong nowadays. Yeah. And he won under a unique set of circumstances. And his current Republican opponent, who's a popular, well-known football coach, uh, who used to be the coach at Auburn, I believe, um, you know, he was acceptable to most yeah. of the voters in the state, as almost any Republican candidate would be. Yeah. Now, looking at uh, some of your analysis, we know that uh, Senator Susan Collins of Maine, that's a big one a lot of people are focused on tonight. I feel yes. like we haven't touched on Susan Collins as much. Uh, she's going against Sarah Gideon, a Speaker of the House in that's Maine. Right. Um, where does that stand right now? How's that looking? Well, I haven't seen in the last few minutes. I, I don't know if we really know that yet, but that that's another must win for Democrats so to defeat Senator Collins, who was very strong for many years. And she became identified with President Trump, you know, reluctantly by voting for Judge, now Justice Kavanaugh, and uh, that did serious damage to her standing in the state. Yeah. Uh, and it gave Democrats a lot of hope for unseating her. And we'll see if they can pull that off. Yeah, so if, if Democrats can't win, take over majority in the Senate, you kind of touched on this before, with this hypothetical, if there is a President yeah. Biden yeah. or not, um, what does that mean going forward? I mean, how does that all play out? Well, it's very, it's gonna be very difficult for him. And, you know, uh, we have not seen a situation <coughs> Excuse me. Where a Democratic president did not at least start out with both houses of Congress. President Obama had that for the first two years. President Clinton had that for the first two years. President Carter, Kennedy, Johnson, all had that. So I think, and it, the, given given the fact that our parties are so divided, yeah, if uh, it would just mean that all these things that uh, Vice President Biden has campaigned on, he really wouldn't be able to do, um, and. Uh, it might, might mean that it would be vacancies would be you know if they're judicial vacancies would he be able to fill them or yeah. would the republicans leave those seats open as they did with um, uh in 2016 when justice scalia died and they said well we're just going to wait for the next election we're not going to fill that seat i yeah. mean even to get the cabinet confirmed right right basic things and I think of what the, the Democrats have talked about, this whole term, packing the court, if you will. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's almost impossible. Yeah, that, not almost. Once it is becomes, impossible. It becomes yeah. impossible. That yeah. was hard. It wasn't clear they would be able to do some of these things, even if they had a very narrow majority, because there's still some moderate conservative Democrats in the Senate who probably would be reluctant to go along with those things. But if they don't have even 50 votes, no, yeah. that's not even a discussion anymore. Yeah. So if you are a Republican watching this right now and you supported Donald Trump mm -hmm. and you're looking at how this is playing out in Congress, you're a little happy tonight. I think that Republicans, from what we've seen so far, yes, it's so far, we don't know how everything will shake out, but so far it's going better than expected for them. All right. Now we got to talk about the presidential race. A lot, 
Everybody's focused on that, that everyone's looking at some of those key states right now. At last check, I recall Florida still being too close to call at this point, even though the president, Donald Trump, does have, have an edge there at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think it's looking pretty good for him in Florida, and uh, that means that this is, gonna, this is going to drag out. If Vice President Biden could win Florida, could, um, I think you know that could be decisive. It doesn't look like it's going to be that way. Yeah. Um, it, he underperformed uh, Hillary Clinton's vote in Dade County, the Miami area. Like how? Like how does that? How did that happen? Play out? Yeah. Well, we're not really sure, but um, it, 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 however it happened, it happened, and it was a polling error. Yeah. Last time there was a problem with polling of basically white working class people in the Midwest. Yeah. That were. Uh, and this time it seems like um, the Cuban community was in, gonna, yeah. in South Florida and perhaps other communities weren't polled. There's some indication that African American turnout is down a little bit. Um, it's, that's more preliminary. Yeah. But now, so, is there a case that, you know, maybe some people, especially Cubans, yeah. perhaps in Florida, they really weren't too keen of Donald Trump back in 2016, yes. but perhaps this time around, now there's, that he's he does have a record? Yeah, I mean, there's some suggestion that Senator Rubio and other other Florida uh, Republican Cuban American leaders uh, were not so thrilled with uh, candidate Trump and they thought he was going to lose and this time they worked harder for him and we're going to find out in the days to come what exactly happened yeah. but um, it is a big plot twist so far this evening uh, you have to say and it's definitely got a lot of Democrats worried at this stage. Yeah so we're looking at uh, we know that CBS News just projected uh, that President Trump has won Louisiana there. We're looking at it in there, in that column. Yeah. Um, and we know that generally when you're looking at the region, you can sort of get an idea of where, you know, the neighboring states are going to go. Uh, does that get, offer us any any clues into how Texas is going to pan out at some point? Texas is so big. Uh, even though it's so large, it's yeah. It's so big and it's so diverse. Right. I, I, I think Texas is always a heavy lift for Democrats. There are all these states where the Democrats are gaining ground. But in our system, it doesn't matter if you go from 46% to 48%. Yeah. Uh, maybe it should. We should all, every vote should matter, but that's not the way it works. Yeah. You have to get over that hump to a majority. And Texas is going to be always going to be difficult for Democrats. Most of the scenarios f for Biden winning weren't about Texas. Yeah. You know, uh, so, so I, you're still you're confident that President Trump is going to take Texas at I the end of the, likely, the night. Okay. I think it's likely. I could be. You know, we've had already one surprise this evening. Uh, I would. I still think that would be an upset for Biden to take Texas. I really do. But what about the fact that we're even talking about Texas? Well, yeah, space? because the trend there is favorable to Democrats, yeah. the, and I still think. But the question is, when is it going to be enough? You know, maybe it's 2024, maybe it's 2028. The yeah. trend is favorable. Beto O'Rourke almost beat Ted Cruz there two years ago yeah but again almost you know it doesn't doesn't cut it if yeah, you want sure. it, you know, the electoral <laughs> college you win it or you don't it's winner take all and so I think um, he's gonna he'd do better in certain counties we uh, than Democrats have been doing before but it, the total is what matters yeah so for the people who are watching on our digital platform here they're they're perhaps looking at these projections, these numbers coming in. Yeah. Uh, we should point out as well that these numbers aren't final. They're just no. projections based on the numbers, the ballots that have been counted That's so right. far. That's right. And states vary very much in the number of votes that they already have. Yeah. Some states have been counting the early votes uh, before the polls even closed over a number of days. Florida has been doing that. That's yeah. why we have so much more of the Florida vote. North Carolina has been doing that, so we have more of their vote. Some of these other crucial states Pennsylvania, Michigan is going to be much slower. Yeah, yeah. Now, does it matter the order in which they're counting some of these ballots? Sure. We know that a lot of Republicans went out to the polls today, yes. cast their ballots on election day, so those votes are being counted first in a lot of places. That's whereas you do have the mail being processed for perhaps Democrats who that, decided that to vote early. That also varies from state to state. In some places, as I say, because in the states where they were counting the mail-in votes ahead of time, yeah. they actually have that vote before the same same day vote. But that's not all the states. Yeah. So that's why when you see a fragmentary percentage of a state's vote that's in, it's very uh, risky to infer too much because, right, if it's the people who voted by mail, that's one story. If it's the people who voted today, that's another story. Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to talk about the shift, and maybe you can offer us some in insight here. The shift in politics, how we see these these states going from, from red to blue in some yeah. cases. You know, you look at Colorado, Senator Cory Gardner is facing a challenge from yeah. a John Hickenlooper, the former governor there, a Democrat, yeah. 
and we're seeing Colorado sort of move away from this battleground stage to a blue state. Mm -hmm. I think of what happened in Virginia. Let's take the 7th District as a good example. You know, you had uh, House Majority uh, Leader Eric Cantor back in 2014. That big upset with yeah. uh, more of a Tea Party candidate, yeah, Dave primary, Brett. Yeah, primary. and then you have Abigail Spanberger. Right. So you have this big shift within a six-year period yeah. of going from, from red to blue. Yeah. Uh, how does that happen? Well, I mean, the party's bases of support uh, are, in some cases, uh, the party's bases of support are changing. So yeah. the Democrats have lost ground among uh, white working class people. They've gained ground among college educated and sort of white collar uh, white people um, and uh, s stronger with young voters, yeah. you know, Democrats and for. So some, some, in some cases what's happening is it's the party's strength is shifting in different demographics and that helps them in certain areas and hurts them in others. In some cases, the composition of the community is changing because in a place like Northern Virginia, there's so much migration into the area. Or in Denver, in, in, in Colorado, there's so many people moving in and they're bringing their politics with them. Yeah, yeah. So people move from California to Colorado and that, that shifts the vote. Yeah, and finally, Dr. Carroll, so what happens from here based on what we're seeing play out? Folks watching these results come in, What's your big summary? How do how do we proceed? Well, well, I would say the short version of it is President Trump uh, has reason to be uh, encouraged right now. He's doing better than a lot of people thought he would be, and Republicans are in better position to hold the Senate than many people thought they would be. It's not over. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna take a while now. Uh, as I said, if, if Vice President Biden could have, could could have grabbed Florida, it would have been a decisive showing. Yeah, and that's not what we're seeing. So. Uh, it, it's the Republicans right now are, um, you know, the polls were so bad for President Trump. Uh, people really writing him off. He may yet lose, but he's in a better position than people would have thought just a few hours ago. Yeah, yeah. All right. Dr. David Carroll, Associate Professor, Government and Politics at the University of Maryland. Thanks for giving us some of your time tonight. Thank you. All right. And we will see you on television. So you're staying, uh, uh, talking for the 11 I think so. I think they have me.
60% of the vote to President Trump's uh, 33%. So you can see the Democrats, Joe Biden, have done much better. This is something that I've been wanting to focus in on all night. I'm finally able to do that because we're finally getting numbers out of Frederick County, which was one of the closest counties uh, in the entire state in 2016. So in 2016, uh, the Democrat Hillary Clinton in Frederick County actually lost having 45% of the vote to President Trump's 47.4. So you can see, based on this, still have some votes to count, but Frederick County appears to have flipped. I want to show you something that you'll be able to keep a close eye on as you go with your second screen experience tonight. So this is our, uh, our, our uh, WUSA9.com slash election site, and this is also on our app as well. If you go to that URL, you're going to be able to enter any keyword here. So for instance, any race in Prince George's County, right? And it's going to come up with the Board of Education seats. You're going to also be able to just type in any of the hot races that you want to find. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to find what's going on in Leesburg in the mayor's race, obviously you'd want to spell Leesburg right first, and then first it would just come up like that. So there's a bar on the top of our app right now with election results and more. Now, your WUSA 9 weather forecast, sponsored by Cox. Okay, we're in a nice stretch of weather. Tomorrow even milder than today. We're looking at 68 tomorrow, near 70 on Thursday with sunshine. We should be 70 on Friday, even 71, and it's last through the weekend. We're talking low 70s on Saturday and Sunday. Instead of mostly sunny, we'll say partly cloudy, but pretty nice for early November. We're looking at temperatures continuing in the 70s next week. Now, Monday, we still have some clouds coming in, but we're dry. Tuesday, some showers and storms are possible. High temperatures in the mid 70s. The storm that hit Nicaragua, uh, Hurricane Ada, could bring us moisture next Tuesday and Wednesday. All right, as we leave you tonight, I want to tell you something special that we encountered today outside the Fairfax County Government Center. Lots of people there waiting in line to vote. Among them were ladies representing three generations of the same family. For three generations to come together and be able to stand together and vote is something that's going to be forever in our hearts. It's, it's a big deal. I mean, to me, it's, it's a life changing event for me. You know, I'm just so blessed to be here to see this happen. Three generations of women voting together for the very first time. And that's something, Bruce, that's right? Great. Yeah. Something to punctuate your 44 years here since this is our last election night together. We're going we're gonna to extend it as long as we can. Thanks for staying up with us this, uh, this night. We're still going to be up, keeping you up to date on what's happening. We'll see you in another 30 minutes for a brief update. Okay, but for now, we're going to send it back to Nora O'Donnell and our colleagues at CBS News. After a brief break, we'll see you soon.